Hiya, my name is Freya Maver. Um, I've been in things such as Skins, Sense of an Ending, La Dame dans l'auto, and more recently, Dead in a Week or Your Money Back. And you are listening to Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, scrolls of all ages, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and of course, good night. Welcome to Neil Before Pod's episode on Secret Invasion. Before we get to the good stuff, though, I will say that we do want to indicate our support for the strikes that are happening over in America. We have actually recorded this during 2023 WGA and SAG after strikes. Without the labor of the writers and the actors currently on strike, the thing you're about to listen to wouldn't exist. We have nothing to talk about. So we stand with those on strike and support their desire to be recognized and fairly compensated for the work that they do. And with that said, hopefully we can now have a good discussion on Secret Invasion. But I can't talk by myself. I am going to need someone who is at least pretending to be Craig. Hello, potential scroll. Hello. I should be very obvious about my true identity because everyone in this show pretty much is. I don't think I can take that at all on face value. I'm actually going to have to shoot you in the leg right now just to find out. It would work. Put your leg forward there and I'll just have a quick <laughs> shot. Maybe I'm just so badass that I can be shot in the leg and it won't even slow me down. Action hero vibe. Yeah, Super Scroll. You've accidentally fallen into the machine and become Super Scroll. Is that a spoiler? I don't know. It might not have been if you hadn't pointed it out because people might not have known anything about it. Either way, it's too late now. Moving on. Pretend nobody noticed. Pretend that was a scroll and not you or me. You're definitely a scroll. We're doing this... After we had a pre-scroll chat before, and this is also coming out after my DMing of the Dungeons and Dragons podcast. So Craig has invited me back potentially because I DM'd well enough, but potentially more because he wants to torture me with scrolls being the thing I feared most of all the MCU projects. And I think if he is a scroll, that torture is possible, actually, because of something about the scrolls that we can reveal later on. But yeah, okay, let's not do too much spoilerific stuff. I can say that, Gray, before we get onto it, they only did one thing that fell into the category of the thing I was most worried about. So I don't know if that makes it good or bad, but we can talk about that. But I think you should go first. Just spoiler free. Maybe they did a lot of new things to annoy you about this stuff. (laughs) <laughs> it's entirely possible. Although, actually, having watched a few other YouTube analyses on this, there's a few things that they repeatedly do in all of their shows. But anyway, we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Tell me at least your spoiler-free general impression, first of all. Did you get enough out of this to keep you watching the old MCU stuff? Or have you... No, I've had enough. I didn't really get much out of this. I kept watching because at this point I'm still invested in keeping up with the MCU and that's all that kept me watching. But I was coming out of most episodes thinking, wow, that was really dull. And obviously we don't have many episodes of these things. There's only six. And when you're at the end of episode three and thinking, absolutely nothing's happened so far, really. It's very concerning, especially when you're told that the scale of the thing is huge and then it doesn't feel huge. It feels like a smattering of people just chatting in a couple of rooms. Well, I want to ask you about that, actually. So, yeah, that will be a talking point, that scale. So you didn't get the sense of scope that it was boasting about, and I didn't really see what the point in it was, and I don't think it's going to have any ramifications for the MCU in the wider sense, even though it should. Just disappointing all the way through. One tweet I saw was someone talking about how is... They're a TV show that stars one of the biggest actors in the world, Samuel L. Jackson, and nobody is talking about it or watching it. How can that happen? And I found myself a bit 
confused by that myself, just thinking, how did they screw this up so badly? I wonder if we'll answer that question over the next, however long it takes us. Absolutely, and we will certainly try. I will say for myself that I watched this twice through, for which I blame you, because I would have given up on it if you hadn't have said, let's do this podcast. I've watched it twice as well, but I always watched it twice before writing my review. So oh, my right. second watch was as I was going. I don't normally watch things twice, though. And I gave up on Ms. Marvel, I think, on the penultimate episode, didn't watch the finale. And I gave up on She-Hulk pretty early on. It would have fallen in the middle. I would have lasted somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. But it has convinced me that I am no longer going to bother watching any Marvel, I think. I mean, I will watch it if somebody comes out and says, oh, you should see this. It was good for this reason. But I'm kind of done now, I have to admit. I don't trust them anymore. There's plenty of times during the previous saga that I am on this podcast saying, I didn't quite understand this, but I've seen enough that I trust the writers to fill in the gaps and point out that there were things that I just didn't realize. Now I'm the opposite way around. I don't trust the writers anymore. I think they are producing the same sort of thing over and over just with a different flavor on the front. Even if I like a show or character, I'm not convinced that it's worth my time anymore. Not even Lucky Season 2? I'm just not sure why I would bother. If it's going to be this caliber, and I've seen Phase 4, I kind of enjoyed Chong chi and I did enjoy Spider-Man, but the rest of the films, and then I've seen through the TV series, and I, I really enjoyed Hawkeye, and I enjoyed Moon Knight more than I should have done, but the odds are starting to turn against us i think here just the sheer volume and even if they do have an about face it's going to take two years for us to see that because everything's already in post-production and so on so i don't know i think i'm just going to wait and if somebody recommends it somebody points out something being more than just yeah it was okay then I'll, i'll go back in after the fact now just i don't think it's worth the time investment i do have some hope for loki because it's in theory made with the same sensibilities that the first season was And the first season of Loki was mostly good. I wasn't keen on the finale, which I can say about almost all of the MCU shows, actually. Well, the ones I liked anyway, I'm often not keen on the finale. Hawkeye being the exception, I thought that ended pretty well. But Loki season one, I didn't like the ending of, but I liked it throughout. So I wonder if season two will be continuing with that trend. And the trailer looks pretty good, to be fair. Fair enough. I remember quite enjoying it, but I was never raving about it. And I think that's the problem. The high point on average is, yeah, that was okay. And I think I can do better with some other TV series. It's one of those things that time is just so very precious. And if I was into my superheroes beyond anything else, then I would make time for it. But I'm not. I'm the gamer of this group. I'm into high fantasy. I watched The Witcher all the way through, even though it wasn't necessarily worth my time because it was my genre. So superheroes aren't my genre of choice. It's almost a raw practical calculation at this point of what time can I spare, which is a shame. But with the content of material that's out there, I think we're all making that choice. Now, we've said before how there's just so much in the fantasy science fiction subgenres. You can't watch everything now. So things just naturally fall to the back. So I'm not anti Marvel. I don't hate all of it. It's just fallen below a line below which I'm not going to prioritize. So it's just a bit meh, I suppose, condemning as that might be. But let's pick up a few of the points that you said, actually, because they are things that I wanted to discuss that hopefully we can pick up before we even call spoilers. And you did start me out with a sense of scale, and that that is something I did want to talk about. I do wonder if Marvel has had this problem before, actually. I even thought with Civil War it should have been called argument or disagreement because it was just what five or six of them on each side it wasn't really a civil war i wonder if that's something that is then inherent to the mcu and their setup do you think it's actually possible for them to get a sense of scale here or are they doomed by something inevitable in their creation the civil war thing was so they could use the iconic comic book title rather than actually copying it and that was a bizarre case because it brought in the sokovia card something that should have been really important and ended up never really being mentioned again they did more with it in agents of shield than they did in the actual films well yeah and i think there's something similar going on here so they use the 
iconic title of Secret Invasion as a headline for something that's very little like its comic book counterpart. I think Civil War is much more like its comic book counterpart than Secret Invasion is. Okay. But they've made a lot of changes in both. But it's bizarre that they keep selling these things as big universe-shattering events. Yes. And again, what people would say in this show would suggest that it is supposed to shatter the universe. And some of the implications of what goes on suggest that it might shatter the universe. But we've seen time and time again that these things generally don't. What happens is they maybe get mentioned here and there. Look at the blip, for example. It just gets brought up once in a while, and it doesn't really seem to have made any measurable impact on what's going on. The stories haven't changed that much as a result of this massive global, well, universal event that took place. People just seem to be getting on with it after it, and it's something that's largely been forgot about. I feel like there's a lot of that going on here. The threat seems to be larger than the thing gives it credit for, but also I feel like they're not going to shatter the universe in a TV show that a lot of people maybe don't watch, a streaming show that a lot of people don't watch, but then they also want new viewers to come into their films or shows without having a lot of baggage attached to them, and then that means that these things can't have massive impact, because if you have to spend half the film explaining why things are the way they are, that can be an issue. They might be actively just pushing the reset button at the end of everything, which is very limiting story-wise. I wonder if they've got even that under control, though, because we're generally slightly confused, I think, with... And you're going to hate me bringing it up, but it's it's my go-to for everything. Multiverse of Madness and WandaVision, where the events of WandaVision are just hand-waved away by Doctor Strange, as if, yeah, that wasn't a problem. And anybody that has seen it is going, you what?! You can't just take away the fact that she enslaved and mind slaved a bunch of children, but it does. It has to, as you say. They do seem hamstrung by it, but they're not even necessarily clever enough to wind it into the script sometimes when there are consequences. So I wonder if Secret Invasion technically does it better by not having too much that needs to be reconsidered afterwards, which is, of course, a very naff thing. Yeah, we're inconsequential. Don't worry about us. In which case, what's your audience going to do? It's a shame, but it does make me think then that, yeah, if they're not going to do the blip, as you say, and they don't appear to have done, because I don't think the scrolls have anything to say about what happened to them in the blip at all. If they're not going to do the blip, then what is one takeover of one small planet? But it's a tricky one. I, I do understand, and you've said it to me, that Marvel wants you to not worry too much about ongoing continuity. You should enjoy things for their individual element because they're not trying to build a complicated story. That was a long lesson for me to learn, but let's say I've learned that now. That means I need to take this show on face value and enjoy it for what it is. And I'm going to pick up then from Fury because it's definitely his show. And so a question I'm going to throw to you is, is this Fury what you wanted him to be? And potentially, is he consistent enough with what we've seen him before that it won't offend anybody if they've made small changes? Do we transition into spoilers before I start dropping everything? I think you don't need to. Just don't go into the detail. You can just give me some basics of what you think. That's all. High level. Okay. It's difficult because on one hand... I am quite interested to find out a bit more about Nick Fury as a person Mm. and what makes him tick, what he actually thinks about stuff, what he stands for, because everything we've seen of him before is he's the enigma. He's probably always lying to you. He's operating on a level you don't understand. He has plans within plans within plans. You just don't know what he's all about. He's working with you because it suits his purposes at that time, but he's already playing a a game that you don't even know exists. That's the kind of person that he's been set up to be. So having a TV show where he's the lead, you can't do that really because you have to get more from him. We talk about it a lot, but Angel, he can't be the enigmatic guy who walks away when you're not looking in his own TV show. You need to get more insight into who he is because he's the lead of his show now. You can't get away with that. Or... To use another example, it's Joey from Friends. When he spins off into his own TV show, he should become more than the idiot. But his own spin-off failed to do that. They just made him another idiot, and then he was surrounded by idiots. So it's Joey and all the characters that are exactly the same as him trying to run a show, and it doesn't work. I was okay with some of the greater insight they gave us into Fury, but also 
I had issues with them stripping him down to nothing in order to, in theory, build him back up and have thoughts on whether they actually built him back up or even deconstructed him properly. Yeah, so I'm conflicted about what I wanted from Fury. Well, that's a talking point that I want to bring back up, actually. I really want to dig into that. And I'm glad you brought it up here because it is going to be a big deal. I would accuse this show of doing exactly that in a way that they've done seemingly consistently for quite a long time, actually. I noticed it throughout Phase 4. I've seen some internet commentary, though, that says it goes back before that. Most recently, I watched something that said Black Panther is brought back down to nothing, even though he was very competent in Civil War. I'd have to watch it again to be sure of that. But all I'm saying is I'm prepared to believe it because I think that individual writers on the MCU are now following tropes. Well, maybe they're always following tropes, but they are now following the trope of hero has to start as nothing, as you say, so he can be built up or she can be built up or they can be built up to be inevitably the best they can be at the end. And it involves ignoring everything they've done before. So I'm going to go as far as to say this isn't Nick Fury as I thought of him. And I don't think it's the Nick Fury that I wanted to see. And we'll dig deeper into more about that. But I I didn't feel as massively betrayed as I did with Black Widow and Doctor Strange. But I just felt so sorry for Nick Fury that he doesn't get to shine because I think he could have taken something where he's a spy. And what you see behind the camera is the emotional cost of the decisions that he has to make. Normally, he's up there leading and he says, you go and do that. And they go off and do it. And it's quite horrible. But it's part of the plan. He moves the chess piece. Whereas now you get to see him go back into his own home afterwards, shut the door and regret it all and be upset by it all and get angry at his own mistakes. And that to me would have been the way of giving you what you're talking about with Angel, that extra layer that you didn't get to see before because you only got to see the visage that's placed over the top. So not quite a portrayal, but I think a weakness and a sorry one at that. But I want to extend it further into if we were going to see an Ink Fury here, I know the MCU doesn't really lean into genres much. They stay with their MCU genre that they've built up. Got to have a big fight at the end. Got to have lots of comedy in it because nobody wants to be too serious for too long. But it should be entertaining at least and it should be upbeat and it should be reasonably positive so you can get behind that hero and really enjoy the ride. So they've created the MCU genre. For better or worse, it is And we have liked it. Even I've liked it. But they do bend it slightly sometimes. Let's bring Multiverse of Madness back. You were happy to get the horror element in with it. So it was a little bit MCU, but it was more Sam Raimi than any non-Sam Raimi film was going to be. And I think you celebrated that. So I want to come back to this then and say, do you think they sufficiently bent this as far as they could towards being a spy thriller that you would think Nick Fury would be associated with? Or do you reckon they dropped it and said, no, there's just no way. We, we just can't do it. Yeah, I agree that this MCU doesn't really do complete genre breaks in the way that they even advertise, actually. When they advertised Captain America, The Winter Soldier, as as a, a Cold War spy thriller or whatever it was they yeah. kept saying, that kind of vibe. And it's just, that it has that flavour, but it's still a superhero action movie. Yeah. Doctor Strange, the second one, has the flavour of the horror movie yeah. and so on. They don't ever veer completely into whatever genre they're knocking on the door of because I guess they want to have that kind of house style on everything where people will just feel comfortable maybe watching everything. I'm fine with that actually as a, as an idea, because I feel like they've given us enough difference across the range of projects that they've brought out for it not to feel like everything's exactly the same. But I don't think this leaned far enough into the spy thriller genre to work, because you really need more reveals, more surprises, more intrigue to make that work. And I just don't think it was there. I imagine you could probably watch, I haven't seen much of it, but the BBC, is it a BBC show, British show, Spooks? It is, yeah. That's a proper spy thing, isn't it? It is. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know from talking to people, they were expecting something more like that. Yes. And didn't get it. Or, I don't know, the Americans, I guess, is the other one that I haven't seen yet. That's about the Russians preparing to blend in as Americans or or something like that. Something like that, especially with shapeshifters. So I think there was more expectation placed on it in terms of, here's the stuff that you could be knocking on the door of, and it just didn't. I don't think it gave us enough mystery and intrigue and reveals and I don't think it kept me surprised or interested in what its central mystery is because it didn't really have a central mystery because a lot of the 
the reveals were really predictably obvious as well. I would agree with that and would say that I think you could replace Nick Fury with a wide variety of characters here and it wouldn't have changed the story because of that. You really just needed somebody with access to Stark technology, which we've seen given to Peter Parker. And now that there's plots coming up where Stark technology is potentially going to be stolen or just be gifted out through his will potentially to the rest of the Avengers. Arguably, I think you could replace Nick Fury with any Avenger whose personality wasn't over the top and crazy like Hulk and Thor, obviously. But anybody who was prepared to do a little bit of behind the scenes stuff would have passed easily through this plot and you wouldn't have noticed any difference. I was bothered by that, actually. I wanted to see twists and turns. I wanted to see Nick Fury playing chess. I wanted to see him moving pieces around the board. I wanted him to use his superpowers, which are the control and use of an army of spies, assassins and agents, and even Avengers now, because he can't solve the problems by himself. But he's never worried about that. He saved the world by creating the Avengers. That's what he does. So There is no Nick Fury in this really, I think, that I could appreciate, which is really noticeable. And I do think this is the reason why a lot of people have struggled with it. And speaking of things that people have struggled with, I can't help but bring up the opening sequence. And there's the obvious commentary that we're going to have to make on it being AI generated. We will comment on that because how could we not, especially with what we've said at the start of this particular episode. But I am going to say that I thought that the opening sequence was actually, I don't know if I can call it good, but I thought that it promised something on topic. I thought that it did promise spy espionage and threat behind the scenes no matter whether i liked the fact that it was ai generated or not i thought it made a promise and it was a good promise it was a promise that i don't think was inevitably fulfilled and a lot of people have criticized it for many things but where do you stand on on that do you think the opening sequence suggested spy thriller with hidden threats well enough no matter what other issues it might have had i couldn't really get past the ai generation of it all i know it was really? faces okay. melding into other faces and all that stuff tell me about that then why not i wanted to dodge it i thought we'd go past it we can't do it it's too big an issue tell me about that well it's funny because the first episode aired and then it came out in the press that the opening titles were ai generated and that's all people were talking about in regards to the opening episode it was yeah people were talking about the show but they weren't talking about the show they were talking about two minutes of it, whatever. Mm. I think it shows how much contempt Disney have for creatives that they're willing to do this because they could have paid someone to throw together an opening sequence or paid an effects house or however many people usually work on these things. They've done it before. Everybody does it as in pays people to give us opening titles for this thing and we'll put music over it. So I don't understand why they did this other than the fact that they just didn't want to pay someone to do it. And they thought, hey, we'll get away with this. And well, they didn't. I suppose they... No, they didn't get away with it because people stopped watching the show. I don't know if it was for that reason or a confluence of other reasons, but I think there was a lot of people that said, I'm not going to watch this. I don't want to support Disney taking work away from creatives in this way. So I I had a major problem with them using AI for something that they could have employed someone to do. And I thought the titles, I mean, they were fine as these things go, I guess. I don't usually pay an awful lot of attention to opening titles. I watch them once and then I skip them, especially when they're this long. Well, yes, the opening titles of a show, if done well, I think can add to the show. I think if I remember rightly, during the Hawkeye TV show, they gave you Kate Bishop's backstory. How did she turn from a little girl into someone who could be an aspiring superhero? So it gave you something. Any show that has got a good title sequence will provide a bit of data. Maybe they update the title sequence throughout to reflect the plot. Maybe they give you data about some part of the background that you understand more as you see more of the background. And I honestly thought that this title sequence, and let's say if it had been animated by an artist and paid for it, if they'd have done that, I think the show promised me that spy thriller that I wanted. So yes, it failed because they revealed some metadata about it, which was abhorrent to people and therefore it couldn't be discussed. 
But I think that's such a massive shame because if they just had paid someone to do it, I'm not even into modern art. I find modern art very difficult to get into. But I suddenly found it having a place here. And I do understand a lot of people will probably be yelling at the podcast machine that they're listening to at the moment going, yes, but it was drawn so rubbishly. I can't challenge that. I think a lot of modern art looks rubbish. I'm going to show myself as a Philistine by even saying that here and I'm recorded forevermore. But if it is artistic, if it does have an emotion to it, then I can see something being called stylistically different and that being a real fact. So I think it's a massive shame that that controversy came out over the top because I was prepared to accept this as a really interesting modern art piece that showed me you're going to get the spy story that you really want. Then of course it gets slapped in the face and it isn't that. So it's even more of a betrayal at that point. But it does highlight something that I am going to try and bring into this because I've mentioned a few times and I don't know what podcasts have gone out and what order I've spoken in, but I'm trying to understand why I liked The Flash, even though it was a rubbish film. That's all part of my understanding of reviewing and analysis. And I think you've just highlighted something that is going to be important to me that I'm going to try and bring in throughout. So at least advertise it so the listeners are aware that I've not lost my rocker. I'm doing this on purpose. I've come to believe that there's this line between objective consistency and subjective enjoyment and everybody has a point on that line that they won't cross by what i mean if somebody is really enjoying something a lot you can take them quite a far away from objective consistency of caring about objective consistency because they're having such a good time that they're not asking questions. And you can go back through something and if it's not consistent enough, your second time through will probably be where you go, oh, this wasn't as good as I thought it was. And that's a massive shame, but it does happen to people, I think. But nonetheless, I I think that there is this point and I've shown through not many subtle means that multiverse of madness and to a certain extent black widow go too far away and they cross that point for me but they didn't for you so our points on that line are in different places what's been most interesting for me then is that this secret invasion that i think is more consistent objectively than multiverse of madness it's crossed a line for you because you didn't get enough subjective enjoyment from it that you were looking for that's just daft oh my god ai controversy and it was pulling those strings it's pulling you out of that i do wonder before we hit spoiler territory is there anything you reckon this show could have done that would have given you that i'm enjoying this enough that i'm not too worried about whether they are or are not detecting scrolls and this, that and the other. I guess it was part of what I was talking about, just greater sense of intrigue, give us more interesting reveals, just get us into the grittiness. I hate that word because it's used so often, but the grittiness of we're spies and we're living in this unpleasant world full of lies and deceit and we don't know who we can trust and all this stuff. Give us more of that. Just make it feel really grubby and really grassroots, the old school spy stuff. Because if you are going to deconstruct Fury back to his basics, you need to see the spy that he once was, the guy that was able to navigate that and then come out on top. You need to see him go back to that, his younger days, where he was presumably more effective at that. Of course, as we'll talk about probably, this show suggests that he isn't perhaps as good as he says he is for reasons that are a bit ridiculous. But that's more of what I want you. I just wanted to live in that uncertainty for so many episodes, just not know what way it was up anymore. Well, Fury is going to be my first talking point when we call spoilers. So we will definitely kick off with that then, because it sounds like it's going to be the biggest and most important point. Who'd have thought the main character was the most important talking point? <laughs> I must have done something on my agenda correctly. Imagine that. Imagine, imagine that. I don't want to move on, though, without picking up on a couple of points that bothered me. And I don't know if they're going to come into the discussion or not. So I don't want to take the risk and I want to bring them up. There's two parts of this that bothered me then. The first one is what I thought was a really dangerous connection to the world's current, let's say, issues with immigration. Whether we're pro or against it, the world is talking about immigration. And I thought that this show handled it really quite surface level and it was quite thoughtless because they turned immigration into this homogenous 
concern with no nuance. And I do believe that it could easily be offensive. And I can explain it if you want, but I, I wanted to ask you, did you get any impression of that when you were looking at it? It's weird because the show drops it pretty quickly. In the first episode or so, it seems like this is going to be the point of the show. Mm. And then it just isn't because you never get the grassroots scroll perspective after a few seconds, really, in the first episode. So it just seems like the message they're saying about immigrants is they will come into your country and eventually try to take it from you, which is the horrific messaging you get from, well, our government that are trying to turn you against the people coming across in the boats, for example. As in, they're coming over to steal your jobs, they're coming over to stay in four-star hotels on your dime, etc., etc. All that horrific messaging. And that seemed to be what the show was getting at. And I think, again, in the whole spy vein, if they'd started off by saying, this is what we're saying, and then later in the season said, oh, actually, it's not, we're saying this. There's more to what we were trying to say early on. We, we tricked you into feeling passionately about this thing, and we've just subverted it for you. But it doesn't do that. So you're left lingering with that message throughout. And they drop it, but I never forgot it. So... That was a problem for me. Absolutely. And I think that's where I, I was thinking of this thoughtless homogeny coming together because they're in England and therefore they have a good foundation for bringing up the Windrush immigration, which is also going to be easy for them to do because Fury is a black character. And it gives them this inroad where they can legitimately bring up immigration that is not going to be too crowbarred in. It's going to be relevant and the character, it's going to mean something to them on a level that's personal. So you think, all right, okay. So yeah, you, you've worked that in and I don't feel like you've just slapped it in my face. But because you've then shown us, as you say, this message about, but immigrants are just going to blow up your country. You're thinking, am I supposed to think that of the Windrush generation? You're not saying that. You can't be saying that. And that's why I think it's just careless. It's thoughtless because they haven't realized that they're just drawing everything together and they're not giving us any nuance. I would have liked to have seen far more clearly something about the distribution of scroll politics that I, can't, I won't mention before, spoilers, that would have given us the nuance that I think we're both talking about here. So yeah, I think that was a massive problem. I'm surprised it's not more of a talking point, actually. I honestly don't believe the MCU writers did this on purpose because even if you just think that most writers are more socialist leaning and have to be socialists, but they're more for the people. You see quite a lot of anti-Republican stuff sometimes in, in the MCU. So I, I don't believe that the show was anti-immigrant at all, but I think it was dangerously careless that they did it that way. But yeah, maybe that'll come up later on. The second point that I wanted to bring up was they were filming this still when Putin had invaded Ukraine. I don't know if I have any thoughts on that one way or another, but it just struck me as odd that it didn't seem to interfere with anything did it affect filming did you hear any stuff on twitter or, or anything to to say that not really no the only thing i know about this is there was a lot of covid production changes that occurred because it was being filmed during covid right so there was a lot of reshoots and things like that the reported budget for the entire show was 212 million dollars oh that was mad yeah it's nuts yeah and when you think about what you're watching you're wondering where's that money going because it's not on screen. So did it all go into actor salary, which I imagine would have been a, a significant bill considering who's in the show, and then COVID situations? And if you think about the fact that it's filmed during COVID, you can sort of see it because you've got Samuel L. Jackson, pretty old guy. He doesn't really share scenes with more than one or two people at a time mm. very often. So you can see the restrictions in play as you're watching it, I suppose. But no, the Russian thing, because that stood out to me, because obviously it's released during the... Russian invasion of Ukraine, but it was, I guess, some of it filmed before or during. It was still in filming, or at least post-production. I actually would need to check that now. But yeah, some of it was going on. Yeah, the MCU Russia is very different to our Russia, I suppose. Yeah, true. There's the whole thing about trying to spark a war with Russia against the US and all that stuff. Yeah, it just seems so dangerous, inflammatory almost. Again, not on purpose. It was just so unexpected. It was like they could have ADR'd the word Russia and changed it to one of the fake Russia-esque countries that exist in the Marvel comics. Well, somebody on the writing staff hates Slovenia, I think, or is it Slovakia? So they could have picked one of those. Yeah, we're just picking on you. Why not? Just you. We had Sokovia, which isn't a real country. So they could have 
done something like that. True. Well, it, it didn't need to affect anything. As I say, I was just surprised by both of those two factors. And just in case they didn't come up, I wanted to acknowledge them. But as we've said, Fury is our main talking point. So I think we're going to have to call spoiler alert, please. You need to keep both eyes open. Okay, that called. Let's get on to the meat and drink of this then. So Fury, we've talked about him not necessarily being in the script that we wanted him to be in. And we talked about him being stripped back. And I think that second point is the one that really bothers me the most. I have got to mention it, if only because of the drinking game that Craig wants everybody to play whilst listening to these things. I honestly believe that Fury was altered by the plot force for this episode, much as I would accuse Doctor Strange, much as I would accuse Black Widow and any and all of them. If you believe it, Black Panther as well, I don't know. Another one to look into. But the idea that somebody has said, I want to write a script where we break Fury down to nothing such that we can have a hero with nothing and build them back up again. And it's become so often that MCU has done this that I am now reasonably convinced that either they've got a lot of new writers or somebody is giving the formula where you have to create this at the start. And I don't know if that's inability or if it's purposeful because the writers thinks that their scripts are so awesome that they can afford to follow this particular trope because we won't see it because that line of objective consistency to subjectivity will be pulled so close to subjective enjoyment that we won't notice and i don't know if i want an answer to that to which is better than the other i do have I think another way of creating a fury that could have been used better, but that is not the correct way for a host to behave. So I'm going to have to put it to you first. Is this the only way they could have told a story about fury by taking everything away from him and starting again? Or do you have other options? No, definitely not. I did talk earlier about putting him back to basics, having him do things that he used to do, navigate the, the landscape in his own way maybe with his contacts, whatever, the way he used to do things when he was an up-and-comer before he was an overseer of all these things. One thing about Fury, though, and it definitely occurred to me during the last episode, is that these projects seem to be, we're going to let you play with these toys for a bit, but at the end you have to put them back in the box. You have to put them back where they were at the start. We haven't seen Fury since Endgame, and even then he doesn't say anything. Have we seen him since? No, I don't think we have. Only as... Talos, I think. Nothing as himself, yeah. Yeah, okay. He's very briefly at the end of Far From Home where he's in space and you don't know what he's all about. He's on holiday, it seems. He's on a fake holodeck beach or whatever it is. We haven't really seen him substantially then since Endgame, to be technical. So we don't know what he's all about. So he starts off this show... He's not wearing the eye patch anymore. People keep telling him he's old and past it and lost his clothes oh, and all that stuff. And then the show ends with him eye patch, the long coat again. He's going back to space, the same old fury that we always knew. He gets to suit up, yes. Yeah, I think that could have been powerful if they'd done it correctly, as in he has that conversation with Sonia that's supposed to be him proving that he never lost it at all, or if he did, he's got it back, and he's the only one that can solve this problem but it didn't come across. At the end of this, he's back in space, he's wearing the eye patch and the long coat again, so he's restored to factory settings for the Marvels. He's going to be Nick Fury, as you know him, when he's in the Marvels, because yeah. this show can't change him in any measurable way. Any opportunity for him to answer for his mistakes, to own up to them, to maybe be changed by them, it's taken away by the fact that he never actually has to do that. It's a trick that someone else seems to be doing that for him. But Fury doesn't say those words. So Fury's learned nothing from this. He's achieved nothing. He's gained or really lost nothing. He's kind of back to where you expect him to be, in charge. I find that very manipulative. And I'm just wondering if that's what I can expect from Marvel stuff now. I'll get to see them mess about for a couple hours and then they'll be right back to where they started. I'm not about that. Even in phase one, two and three, we saw people progress. We saw them change. We saw them evolve. And then... When they came into the team-ups, they were changed from the time you last saw them in a team-up and things like that. So I wanted to see Fury changed by this. Because there was a few things in here that suggested that Fury's a terrible person and he should probably answer for that. And he just never does. So he just gets to go on being a terrible person that never answers for anything. I thought even that was a bit careless, actually, because 
The suggestion is that this whole setup has been a father-son relationship with him and Gravik. In metaphor, obviously not real, but the idea that Gravik was betrayed by his adopted father. And again, it brings me back to the tropes. It's like somebody picked up the manual and you can see the experienced writer standing over the young writer and saying, you have to make it personal. You have to make it about a family or a friend connection. It must all come down to this. Otherwise, it won't mean anything to the audience. Oh, and you have to make them nothing at the start so you can make them everything at the end. Just reeling off the basics of storytelling. But in order to do that here, they have Nick Fury took a child soldier and gave him as his first mission an assassination. Now, I don't honestly believe, as manipulative as I know Fury has been, that he is that downright evil with no consideration for it at all, because the MCU doesn't have that sort of person in their hero set. They made a big deal about telling us that Black Widow wasn't nasty after all. She just made a mistake when she killed Dracov's daughter, and, and she's really upset about it, and she'll never do it again. And now we're asked to believe that in that universe, Fury is somebody who promotes child soldiering and child assassinations. Although that stuff is in phase one, actually. If you think about the Avengers, where Banner says, you spy start that young, and Black Widow says, I did. And that wasn't Fury that did that to her, but the suggestion is that that's just the way that game is played. They need young operatives who can sneak around and things like that. And yeah, I believe that Fury was maybe capable of that. In the Avengers, for example, when it's revealed that he's been stockpiling the Hydra weapons to make his own, when he's called out on it, he's like, yeah, of course I was. We need weapons to fight this threat that I think is coming and retroactively knows coming because I met the Skrulls in the 90s, but that hasn't happened yet. So that's confusing. <laughs> I always believed that he was capable of something like that. And that's kind of what made him interesting. He's this big picture guy. His moral compass is very skewed. There's nothing he's not comfortable with doing. Whether he feels bad about it, we're not supposed to question, but he will do it regardless. And even in Winter Soldier, he says Agent Romanov is comfortable with everything. And it's clear that she is. That's only a retcon that happens later with Black Widow, where she suddenly didn't kill a little girl in a hospital fire that she started and things like that. But I still believe that Natasha did horrible things. And that was the point she was redeeming herself for them. And Fury, I guess, he feels like he was doing it for the greater good and doesn't feel like he has to redeem himself for anything. But was okay with that as a notion. I actually would challenge that, though, because he didn't, as you say, raise the Black Widows as child soldiers. That was specifically somebody else. He brought her on board as an adult, and I have no problem with him using adults to do horrible things. And the fact that he maintains some Hydra weapons, it's not quite the same as having a room full of WMDs. He had some Hydra weapons, and there might have, of course, been the odd powerful weapon, but it, it's not what we're shown. We're shown rifles. So I honestly don't believe we've seen a Nick Fury that's been shown to be that bad. It is a special kind of compartmentalization that allows you to do these things. You're not going to be able to just send a child soldier in in the same manner as you can put a Hydra rifle into a box for when you might need it. So sending Natasha out and saying that she's comfortable with everything is a different thing to doing it. So I don't think we've ever seen him do anything that awful. And everything can be bluster just because somebody says something. I'm all about what were we shown in all of these series? And he is the guy that saves the day by doing cool things and by trickery. He doesn't kill Coulson. He takes some cards from his locker. He might dab them in Coulson's blood, but he didn't kill Coulson. He didn't send Coulson specifically against Loki. And there's a line there that I think is being drawn, not explicitly, but as I say, based on what was shown, I don't think we were shown that. And the reason it bothers me isn't even because of that. The reason it bothers me is because it's just so simply said. You don't actually get enough backstory from Fury or graphic to give you any belief in any horrors and i need to be shown it i think if i'm going to believe that otherwise it stands out to me as this inconsistency now i'm happy to say that our line between objective and subjective is in a different place therefore they crossed it for me they didn't for you i'm happy that that is true but i, I still think you'd have trouble arguing it based on what you saw but nonetheless we're back to these tropes and we're back to bringing 
fury down to nothing. The original question was, do you think they could have done it a different way? And you've said, yes, they could. And you've given me one. I'm going to give you a second one. I would have liked to have seen a few episodes whereby Fury had all the power that he previously had at the start, but it was slowly stripped away from him by clever opponents. Fury, you've got a chessboard of 15 other pieces. I'm going to take away your rooks. I'm going to take away your access to your bishop technology. I'm going to take away your knight vehicles. I'm going to take away a lot of your pawn agents. And it's just going to be you on the chessboard. And then we bring up what you've given us. So he has to become the spy himself and go back out into the field. And he can still be a capable spy. They've not removed anything from him him but they've taken away his cool toys that he so likes to use his chessboard oh it's such a shame that they didn't even consider that that's why i remember these tropes oh we have to knock him down we have to make him useless we have to do what we did to indiana jones and make him miserable i only got through indy 5 by knowing that it wasn't an indiana jones film by the way that got me through that film. I was able to slightly enjoy NG5 because I knew it wasn't an Indiana Jones film. And I was thinking about that with Nick Fury. They had to, like you say, did you play the drinking game where you take a shot every time someone says, you're old, you're worthless, you can't do it, you're not prepared? I mean, how many times in the 80s did we see a film where the young fighter was said, you're not prepared for what's to come? Even more tropes. I was offended by that. And when the guy from Black Widow comes along, oh my God. This Black Widow character, who supposedly is providing the Black Widow with cool toys and useful information, blatantly leads the way for her enemies to her with all the stuff he leaves for her to find. And he has the audacity to say that Fury can't cope with it and can't do it. Oh, I wanted to slap him. So I'm going to say, by this end of this, I was infuriated with this idea of just telling me Fury is old. Did it go that far for you, or was it just a bit annoying. I think some of the depiction of him losing things was quite good, but some of that was down to the way Samuel L. Jackson performed it. For example, the conversation he has with Skrull Rody, where he ends the conversation seeming confident. He says, even when I'm out, I'm in. Oh, yeah. And then he collapses on a bench afterwards, as if to say, now what? I'm screwed. I like that there's the bravado when he's in front of people, but privately he doesn't know what to do next. Mm. Those were little touches that were by themselves quite good. I don't think they fed into any broader story that was being told or any broader character development. Like I say, that's the point where Fury should build himself back up to the point where he is the only person that can solve the problem, which I don't think they did. So there was aspects of it that were better than others, I think. The Black Widow cameo guy, Rick Mason, the character's name is, I'd forgotten he existed, actually. (laughs) When I was watching the episode, I was thinking... Who's this guy? Am I supposed to know who that guy is? And then if people were talking about online, it was oh, it was good to see Rick from Black Widow again. And I was like, oh yeah, was the it? guy that got her a Quinjet somehow. Okay, if that's your broader connection to the MCU for this episode, then sure. People were theorizing that Daisy from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was going to turn up in this. And instead we got the guy that I can't even remember from Black Widow. So yay, I think. <laughs> I was expecting to get a really good character back and then I got this idiot. So you've surprised me, yes, but... <laughs> not a good surprise I mean maybe surprising me is enough for you if, if I come away and say I was surprised I hated it then maybe you're okay with that I don't know them being Disney back to the original question I guess Fury losing everything and then building up I don't think was done particularly well but I think some of it was performed quite well or I think some of it could have been good if in a better sequence of events as well the collapsing on a bench because he knows he's alone and showing what he really feels and thinks that's the kind of thing you would have maybe expect in a TV show where your enigmatic character is elite. To go back to Angel, you see his reaction to failure, or you see how driven he is to solve a problem because he's the main character now. It's not like he was in Buffy, where you would turn up and perform a specific purpose and then leave, which is what we've had from Fury beforehand. Whereas this one, he has to be the driving force of the plot, and I don't feel like he really was. Well, let's capitalise there on something you have said, though, because I could slate the writing of Fury forever and the audience would probably get too much hate and negativity from me. So I need to turn it back positive at some point. And you've given us the inroad to do that, which is the acting. So let's bring in Ben Mendelsohn as well. Are you prepared to extend that this was acted well into the conversations that we had Body movie style between Fury and Talos. Yeah, I think that was some of the best stuff about it. People talked quite positively about the train scene, 
where Fury just tells an anecdote from his childhood. And that was a really good spy negotiation type scene. He offers something of himself because he wants something in return. And the thing he offers of himself is a calculated inroad into that thing that he wants. So even he's being selective with what he's revealing. That's the Fury you want to see, the one that, who understands the currency of information, I suppose. He's trying to get a good exchange rate on the information. And I like how it dovetailed into the tell me something I don't know. It's the way his mother sniffed out a lie and asked him to, to do the same thing. Apparently that anecdote was actually from Samuel L. Jackson's childhood as well. Nice. So it was something, I guess, he brought to it. Fair enough. Stuff like that was very good. I do think the Fury in Talos or Talos, it depends who's saying it, isn't it? How they pronounce it. It's about like in Batman, Ra's al Ghul or Ra's al Ghul one. Yeah. Which one's right? And whichever way you want to pronounce it. I think the scrolls call him Talos. So I'm going to go with that. Do they? Okay. I'll stick with that from now on. Yeah. So the friendship between them was really good. And I think they had a couple of really good scenes some of the actual content of those scenes was questionable, such as Fury saying, I was rising through the ranks, and Talos said, it was only because we were helping you. You had an oh, army of shape-shifting scroll agents, and we're why you were so great at your job. And I was thinking, oh, so Fury sucked at his job, and the only reason he was good at it is because he used what the shapeshifters brought to him? Well, that sucks. It does, But yeah. I liked the scene. I liked the conversation. I liked the way it was performed. And it's one of those sleight-of-hand type things where... It's not until I think about it after the conversation that I start thinking about how the content is not so great. Yeah. But it's one of those, these two actors are acting the crap out of this and I'm really enjoying watching them bounce off each other. And then after it, it's like, oh, but what they were saying was garbage. This is answer to my point above then, actually, about what could they have done to bring this subjectivity, this enjoyment back in so we wouldn't have seen this and maybe they did need to have a focus down on these two characters because one of the thoughts i had was that if you really wanted to make this a spy story and you really wanted to get the threat level up then you keep it personal and you don't see anything that the two main characters don't see so when they are approached by maria hill for the second time both of them are like is she a scroll I have no idea. Were you keeping track of her? I turned around to go for a drink. I have no idea. They could have had anything happening off camera immediately brings that doubt back in. And we would have enjoyed it because these two actors, these two characters had such a lot going for them that we would have enjoyed watching them deal with problem after problem after problem. Even to the extent that when they both get separated and have to come back in again. Are you a scroll? Of course I am. I'm Talos. What are you talking about? You can even have you put some silly Marvel jokes in there as well, just to lighten it up so it didn't have to be too dark. I shouldn't have said silly Marvel jokes there. That was offensive. But you know what I mean? They could have put light humour in. Tell me something that Talos would know, and he tells them an embarrassing story about some time they worked together in the past, something like that. Yeah. But there's so many different ways that I would have preferred to have seen these two. And I'm glad we've brought up that their scenes together are good and i'm not surprised that one of the things you've said is it's the actors that brought it not the writers let's acknowledge that but unfortunately you have opened the door again to my hatred so we're going to walk through you've said that they've undermined fury by saying that he was pretty much incapable which is a bit offensive so they really stripped fury back down to nothing here i think they've gone a step further so you can tell me whether you agree with this or not i have this suspicion that the character Sonia Falsworth, played by Olivia Coleman, is only in the show because they were shooting it in the UK and someone said, we really need to get one of these UK actors in here. Who can we get? We've got Olivia Coleman. Brilliant. Find her apart. Because when you're watching this, she's not a main character. She's definitely a secondary character. She has no development. She's there to serve plot purposes. So she's on screen and she's got stuff to do. She's big enough to be more than tertiary, but she's only a secondary character without that character, without that development. But she gets scenes by herself. And you're thinking, why is a secondary character getting scenes by himself? What is she doing? She's doing spy stuff. That's very interesting. We've not got any spies in this that could be doing any and all of this. Oh, we do. Nick Fury. So... Why were we taking away good spy material, good spy plot that Talos and Fury could have been going buddy movie round and giving it to a secondary character? I think that's such a shame then that they've stripped something else away from Fury. Anything that could have been competent spy work, 
they gave to Sonia. Now, I'm not saying she was a bad character, because I think that when you see Olivia Coleman, you generally are going to enjoy the performance. And even though I didn't like the character myself, I think plenty of people would have liked it. And I think I'm prepared to say I thought it was well written, even if I didn't personally like it, objective, subjective. But Despite being potentially well acted and having some use in the plot, I think she just took away from Fury. So can you challenge that? Do you think she actually was a main character? Do you think that no, Fury was fine as he was and didn't need to be doing anything Fanya was doing or opposite or different? I didn't really think about her in those lines, actually. She does that thing that they do with a lot of characters where they say, horrible or threatening stuff, but with a cheery voice. Oh, I hate that so much. (laughs) I know people like it. I do appreciate that some people love it, so I won't say it's bad, but I hate it so much. Anyway, sorry, carry on. I just had to let the hate out. I would like them to get rid of the Valentina character and replace them with Sonia because she is less irritating. Okay. (laughs) I think that she could take on that role because she was effectively in that role, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was written for that character and then they couldn't get Julia Louis-Dreyfus for the show, so they just came up with this other character who's basically the same and had her do that sort of stuff. But yeah, she was doing a lot of the stuff you would expect Fury to be doing. She was wandering in and rooting out scrolls and figuring stuff out. I liked her introduction as a character that's on Fury's level. She's a peer and they have respect because they've been through it and in theory risen to the position through hard graft and whatever. Turns out Fury just used intel that he got from shapeshifters, so he had stacked the deck. He had an unfair advantage over other people that were trying to rise through the ranks in the same way. He was hoarding his greatest resource kind of thing. And I think it's in the first episode, maybe the second episode, where he gets captured by Sonya and he reveals, well, I wanted to be caught so I could bug your office. And she didn't see it coming. And I was thinking, she would see that coming, unless she knows that he was going to bug the office and it was her plan all along, which it wasn't because later in the show, she finds his bug and says nice one you did that but i found it eventually so it was supposed to show us that fury still had some of his mojo because he could trick sonya but it's it felt like an obvious trick this is where i talk about surface level spy writing because you could imagine a similar scene in a better written spy thing where they are one-upping each other with what they say carefully choosing which lies to tell each other and things like that fury plants a bug that she's supposed to find so that she doesn't find the real bug that he's left somewhere she wouldn't think to look for it, for example. Or she knows the bug is there and she makes sure she has a conversation in front of it that will send Fury in a particular direction that she wants him to go in. Stuff like that. There was many open goals they could have had with that conversation and the, the consequences of it that they didn't take. It was just very simply Fury managed to trick her and she fell for it. And yeah. it ends up devaluing her character because she didn't see it coming. Because I, the viewer, I'm not a super spy and I saw it coming. So what does that say about the characters in the show? Or what does that say about the writers of the show? But yes, she does a lot and she ends up moving the plot forward more than other characters do, actually. But as a force, not as a character, really. Yeah, Yeah, but that is stuff that, as you say, could have been done by Fury and Talos. I'm thinking of the torture scene that was actually more brutal than a lot of other things we've seen in the MCU. That could have been Fury doing that. Maybe Will Talos stood at the side and said, this is too much, stop it. This is one of my people, don't do that, that kind of thing. There's plenty of options that you could have used Fury in her place. I don't know what you would have done with Sonya in that circumstance. She needed to be an antagonist. She needed to be not necessarily a villain, but she could have been a villain. But she would have been the neutral force that they were still having to overcome a barrier to get past. And eventually they persuade her to come on side. And then it's an it's another chess piece that Fury puts back on his board. When he's lost all his chess pieces, he's got to go and get some more. So she starts out as an antagonist but then she becomes a chess piece that he can use. So I think she did have a place, but this, as you say, surface level writing blocks it. I think you see it a few times, actually. I've got it in my notes as the clever or not game. Is something clever because they tell you it's clever in the writing, or is it supposed to just be cool? Because I was thinking that when Sonya knows that the scrolls will be tipped off and coming for the prisoner that she raids, Hang on a minute, how did she get that knowledge? And if she already had that knowledge, why did she worry then about there being a mole later? She just says that she knows that she's been uncovered. Well, in that case, why did she do something about it? So it it sounds like she's being clever on the face of it. When you think about it, she could have taken a lot 
better actions there. She certainly didn't need to go herself, although maybe she can't trust anybody because they're all scrolls. But how do we know that she's got that concern? Because there's not any writing to tell us. And the scrolls didn't seem that bothered about her moving about and doing stuff, even though she represented probably the most major threat that we see in the show <laughs> to their plans. Because she's the only one that actually seems to do anything for most of the show. I can't stay on Fury forever, but I can't really leave this character assassination without mentioning a few other things that really knocked me. I think I've got yeah, two other things that I want to say in here. One of which is, is this show entirely pointless based on Fury's complete ineptitude? Because as well as the stuff we've been given, he also stupidly didn't tell anybody that they were in negotiations with the Kree. And if everybody had waited a couple of days, maybe, or do I be nice? Maybe it could have been a couple of weeks. A lot of people were on a lot of airplanes, so there must have been some flight time. But it could have just been a couple of days. He must have known that the Cree talks were going well enough. So why didn't he just say, don't worry, everybody calm down. In a couple of days, we'll have made peace and it'll be fine. Doesn't he say at the end of the show that they've just opened a dialogue rather than they were on the go for an untold amount of time? They said that the Kree have agreed to end the war and it's all going to be fine. They've agreed to call peace. Mm -hmm. Misremembering. I thought you said something about they've decided they want to talk, which suggested that the negotiations were just going to start at that point. Well, you've given me doubt now, even though I've watched it twice. I was pretty sure I watched it the second time round and they said that an agreement had been made. I might have to look that one up. But either way, he must have known it was coming and it was a possibility that he could have told somebody. Regardless of how long the negotiations have been going on for, this isn't something that you've introduced in the show until this point. So it doesn't make any difference to anything that came before. And in theory, if they had been in talks before this point, then all he had to say to stop Gravik and his people from trying to take over the world is, we've been talking to the Kree and we're close to something. And if they did just open a dialogue at the end of the show, that invites more questions such as, why wait until now? And... Why haven't you brought this up before? What was stopping them from talking before? Etc, etc. So it's a problem either way because it isn't part of your show. To me, it just feels like a way to brush aside any potential consequences of this thing because the show ends in a very violent way in terms of the way the scrolls are about to be treated. But they can get around that by, in the Marvels, Fury will say, talks with the Creed went really well and all the scrolls are now off Earth, so that danger's over. So that renders the whole thing worthless in that respect because if the scrolls can just leave earth then whatever the president decides doesn't make any difference i don't know that that's what's going to happen but i suspect it will be i suspect that's why they brought that in at that end point if it even gets mentioned i have done a quick search and i think there's enough evidence to suggest that you are right var is the one to be sent on the diplomatic mission to do the negotiations so that does make sense. But either way, I'm glad you managed to back up my point anyway, even though my own incompetence took me away from it. You've given me faith that you are not a scroll and you are, in fact, working with me. So that's good. That was only one point I wanted to bring up, though. The other ones were Fury's final speech. At the end, doesn't he say things like he's turning his back on his old ways? He's essentially cancelling himself because, oh, I don't want to play anymore. It's always too difficult or I'm too old or I don't think this is right anymore. Isn't that a bit insulting to just get rid of him that way? I don't even know what he means by that because we haven't had any exploration of his character to that degree over the course of the show. So that conclusion just kind of comes from nowhere. Yes, and it, it isn't even built on a good foundation, I don't think, because this whole idea that he had some sort of post-traumatic stress syndrome from being blipped, which I have to admit is perfectly reasonable, is something that I didn't believe from Fury. Even when I'm out, I'm in. I think this whole show should have been built around. That was one of the best lines in this, and I enjoyed that line. It was a cool line, and it did awaken my subjective enjoyment. But somebody who says that line I don't think is somebody who doesn't have a play. He always has a play. When the game got too big for him, he created the Avengers. When the game got bigger still, although this was in a different order in time, let's not worry about it for consistency reasons, the game got bigger still, he gets Captain Marvel on board. He always has a play. The idea that he's suddenly defeated and can't do it anymore. The stakes are already way above what one single human can do. Admittedly, they have completely undermined him by saying everything that he ever did was thanks to Talos and the scrolls. So I do now understand that he was actually incompetent all this time, but 
every time you add another layer into this, it just seems to be insulting to Fury. I'm almost talking myself into feeling betrayed, actually, now. I didn't think <laughs> I was. With Doctor Strange, I really felt it. I honestly believe I'm so inured to this now that I wasn't feeling it. I didn't feel much during this whole show. When he was saying goodbye to his wife, I didn't feel it. When Talos died, and I want to talk about that, when Talos died, I didn't feel it. When anything happened, I didn't feel anything. And that's a massive shame. And it protected me from feeling betrayed. And I do think I do now feel that. I think this was a total betrayal of Nick Fury's character. But I've been down that road often enough. So I want to bring you back. Did you feel anything with Talos? Do you think he had good backstory, good development? The fact that he was naive, did that work for you as an ideology? And when he died, was it traumatic? Any of those things hit you in the heart or head? The problem with his death is it was the third potentially fake-out death in the space of four episodes. So the show trained us to expect death to not be what it seems. Turns out two out of those three deaths did stick, at least for now. Maria Hill is currently still dead, as far as we're aware. Talos was cremated, so therefore reasonably certain that he's dead, unless they just burned something else. I don't know. His death didn't have much in the way of impact on me, though, because they hadn't set it up as being the tragedy that it's supposed to be. And I saw what they were trying to do with it. So you had the whole situation where Gaia thought he was naive and too idealistic and not considering the reality of the situation and all that. So it set her up to understand his point of view, but mould it into her own worldview and find a practical way to make that work. So merge his idealism and her cynicism into something practical. As in, the world isn't like this right now, but here's what we can do to make it like that. Or here's the best way forward based on this. Her seeing his point of view seemed to be where they were going with it, but I never got that impression at all. So when Talos died, I was just thinking, well, that's a wasted opportunity because I feel like there was so much more this character could have given us. Sometimes when character deaths happen, you think, oh, they had a lot more potential, but that's why the, the death could be effective because, oh, we'll never get to see them live up to that potential. And the other characters have to deal with the fact that this character will not live up to that potential. That's part of their grieving process. You would consider that to be a valid exit point for that character because the other characters can pick up what they did and take it forward. But that's not really what happened here. When Talos died, I was thinking, he still has more to do. We're only just getting started with this guy. Yeah, and he doesn't have a backstory more than he is also old and broken and irrelevant, which a lot of characters take the point to say he's the same as Fury that way, which is potentially a nice starting point for that parallel, even though I hate it. I understand that it, it's a good parallel to put them in the same place and they're both old men trying to get back to it, which is a storyline I normally love. But anyway, let's move on. But without that backstory, without any development, his ideology to me just seems so dangerously naive. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe that it was an ideology. Well, throughout, I just kept thinking, are you watching what's going on around you here? Yeah. I can understand that you want this, but this isn't the world you live in. Yeah. So how can you believe that this is reality? Because... It quite clearly isn't. I started to believe it a bit more when he stopped Fury killing Skrulls, or tried to. Because then it becomes an ideology, because he's committing to it in every action, but it's not developed. His relationship with his daughter is not developed. They mention something about the mother, and Guy looks really sad. And then in, within two lines, they're on something else. Everything has moved on so fast. Now, I will say that the acting from... Ben Mendelsohn and Emilia, oh my God, Clark. Oh, yeah, Emilia yeah, Clark. Emilia Clark. The acting from both of them is great because their reactions every time are on point. When you hear about the mother being proud of her daughter, you see it in Emilia's face, how much that hits her hard. When Talos sends his own daughter into danger to get the codes for the submarine, you can see how horrified he is by his own actions there. So the acting is brilliant, but it's only a reaction because it's done, as I say, for two lines and then we move on. So I, I think Telos is brilliantly acted, completely underdeveloped, completely unused, and should have had more screen time with Samuel L. Jackson, but with Fury. I would have liked that buddy movie thing set up. What they were definitely trying to do with Talos and Fury was make him the optimist and Fury the pessimist. Yes, they were. And then they meet in the middle, but they didn't write it well enough because Talos just seems foolish for yeah. thinking that the world is the way it is. The idea of, if we show the humans what we're really made of, 
they will accept us. And Fury's thinking, no, they won't. We can't even get on with ourselves on this planet, never mind aliens that are green. And yes. Talos has been around long enough, surely, to understand that. I think that this would have worked with, I'm going to bring into my next section, which is the scrolls. I think it is a nice link into it, so I'm going to use it. I think this would have worked for Talos if the scrolls that have had two clear and distinct sides to them, if there'd have been the scrolls that were with Garrick and the scrolls that were still working with this ideology. And the people with the ideology were just slowly transferring over to Gravik. And Talos is desperately trying to get some to stay. And how he does that is by making sure that Fury doesn't treat them all as the enemy. No, this one's not the enemy. This one is my friend. And he's constantly fighting this battle to bring everybody back to his ideology. And these two sides are clear. And one of them are the good guys because they won't give up on their principles. Don't matter how badly the universe treats us, we are going to stay true to our religion, our ideology, our family, whatever it is that is the core of that belief. They are the good guys. And then Gravik is the opposite. And he is the one saying, no, practicality. This is how I convinced your daughter. She's come over to me because this is what the real world is like. Suck it up. Everywhere is just as bad. You think the humans are good? They're just like the Kree. And they have this fight going on, and they're both leaders, ideological leaders, if not political leaders for their position, then you'd have had a really powerful general still in Talos instead of a naivety. But as you have said, we didn't get that. We didn't get any of it. It wasn't well written. But given that I think the foundation is in the scrolls, I think we can happily then move on to section two here which have got us the scrolls overall, Gravik, and the grand plan. And I can't resist talking about the grand plan because it's awesome. So you're going to have to tell me what you think about the grand plan, which I think is we're going to create a nuclear holocaust world in which we can live in, even though all the animals and plants are going to be dead and there's going to be no ecosystem to grow our own new plants. Oh, but actually it won't get that far because we'll have superpowers and we'll need them because when the Avengers come in to sort out the world war that we've started, we'll be able to defeat them too. But what if it goes to nuclear disaster? Well, I don't know. It might do. I'm just gambling on that. I've not thought it through. What about the Avengers if we don't get the harvest? I don't know. I might be okay with Groot's powers. I haven't really thought it through. <laughs> so, yeah, what did you reckon to the grand plan? Do you think it was very attractive to the scroll population in any fashion? No, I don't think it was thought out at all. So the idea of we want to take over your planet, well, that's Alien Invader 101, isn't it? The aliens always come to us and they want to take over. And again, the refugee comparison, the idea that we've let these people in and now they want to get rid of us and take over is problematic as well. And it's lost me a lot when they said there were one million scrolls on Earth. Yeah, how did they get there? On what ships that the Sabre Space Station didn't see coming? They all came one by one in escape pods. I don't know. Yeah, and it's one of those problems where it's, well, enough of the Earth must be irradiated so that they could find somewhere to live. Why don't they just live in Chernobyl, for example? That would be fine, wouldn't it? That's probably big enough to hold maybe not a million people, but if you take that and other disused radiation sites across the world, sure, why not? There's plenty of places you could put them. We do have a colony of Asgardians. We don't know how many there are there, but there's a lot of them. And I get it, the idea of, well, the scrolls in their true form, they're green and humans won't respond to that, whereas the Asgardians are all attractive and human looking. So we can just about accept them. Plus they're stuck in their little colony. It's fine. We don't really have to think about that. But I'm surprised that wasn't brought up. Yeah. They could have made that a point, couldn't they? Well, the humans coexist with the Asgardians. It's like, yeah, but they look like humans. We don't. And they did bring in the whole idea of Gaia wanting to live somewhere where she didn't have to wear a face that wasn't her own, that kind of thing. So yeah. that was in there. It was in the subtext, maybe some of the time, the idea, well, we want to live somewhere where we can be ourselves. That, again, is feeds into the old refugee point of view. Fury's speech, when he... It shows himself to be an awful person just after recruiting Child Gravik, where he says, you need to blend in, not make waves, just make sure that no one notices that you're any different from them. It's a really sucky situation for people that just want to live somewhere. Okay, so we have to abandon our own culture and beliefs and way of life in order to fit into this new place. Well, that's not very good, is it? But defeats the purpose of finding a place to call home. It does. So 
that was, again, quite an interesting idea in theory. But Gravik's plan, it seemed to change by the episode and he just seemed like a total madman for most of it. It doesn't help that we never get a sense of who he is, really. I do want to bring that up, actually, because I find him very interesting a character as what could have been. But I don't want to leave the other alone quite yet, so I'll just pull it back. I've seen online the same comment that I've become tired of seeing where somebody in either the writing staff, production crew, or director set says, it's the fault of the viewer that they aren't enjoying this. Either they're not seeing our brilliance, or they're not giving us a chance to do something slightly different, or they're not supporting us because we're doing something good for society and we should get their enjoyment from them anyway. I'm getting tired of this shield that people are hiding behind. And I do understand that the minority on Twitter that are yelling and causing trouble are causing trouble. But still, I don't like this defense from the writers that actually we're geniuses after all. We've already brought up here that they could live in Chernobyl If you don't create a nuclear winter, then animals and plants can still live even in these radiation zones. So you still have an ecology. If you have the resources, oh, we've got control of the UN. We've got the British government. We've got all these other people. You could surely just buy a nice island in the middle of the Pacific somewhere and put everybody there and make it a no-go zone. The writers don't seem to have thought through not only their own continuity, which they're not keen on keeping Marvel continuity between films, so they're not bothered, but they haven't thought about that. But they also just haven't thought through the consequences of what they've written. These scrolls are really well stocked. When Gravit wants to go somewhere, he gets a private jet. What terrorists do you know that are that well-funded? I guess there are some, but generally speaking, when we're told about these people, they are called the Resistance. And when you hear about the Skrulls, they're called the Skrull Council. This is the worst I've ever heard in terms of naming here, by the way. I know what you're doing, but you've not thought about anything about what those names mean. And I think it is starting to become a bit offensive that people are, are not prepared to think through any of it. Anyway, that's my rant over. I'm getting good into my rants here, by the way. I think I could get angry <laughs> as we go along. Does that mean I am or I'm not a scroll? I don't know. Let's calm down again. The Asgardian comparison should have been made, I think, because we already have a colony of aliens that are coexisting with humans quite happily. Yeah. Again, granted, they are attractive and human looking, but th- again, that's something you can go into. You could have done it, but this would have required something like, I think, the buddy movie. This would have required the ideological leaders, where you've got Gravik on one end of the scale, and you've got Talos on the other end of the scale, and people are constantly trying to decide which end they're going to try and balance, or unbalance. And all of these arguments about, but humans would accept us. No, they wouldn't, because we don't look like the Asgardians do. That would be part of your ideological debate. But the show doesn't want to go into that. It doesn't have time for that. So it's a massive shame. Yeah, and then there's a notion of Fury's created a monster in Gravik, as in it could have been, I taught this kid everything I know, and now he's using everything I know against me. So you were talking about how does he get all these resources? If he's Nick Fury's protege, then suddenly I don't question how he gets these resources. He just does because he's as good as Fury because Fury taught him everything he knows. That that would have actually worked. That would have even lent into the whole father-son vibe that they were desperately trying to bring together, but just sort of snuck in at the end as an afterthought. That would have been good, actually. You were my best student, and now that is a problem because you know all my tricks. Or maybe I'm just going to use a few tricks that I kept from you because I was worried that this would happen one day. Because he's Nick Fury. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's come back to Gravik then. The idea of Gravik to me, I think, is excellent. The idea of what he could have been, I think, is excellent. But I'm not convinced that it was believable. I think I know what they were going for. I saw some parts of a charismatic leader, somebody who is leading a cult of personality. That's how he gets people to give up on the nice ideology of Talos, because Gravik's personality is so strong that people are swayed by him no matter what he says. But I don't know that I saw enough of that on screen. I do think that I saw the writers trying to show me that cult of personality failing. As the episodes go on, then 
people started to question him. Pagon questions him at the start with scientists. And then later on, of course, there's a direct challenge from Pagon. And then there's a direct challenge from a group of scrolls. There's three moments and it's worse in each one. And I think that even the point where Gravik says, no, bomb us, bomb me and new Skrullos is supposed to be the cult of personality failing so completely that he goes to his desperate plan. I was never going to do it this way, but I'm running out of supporters here. All I've got left is Rhodey. What can I do with him? This anti-fury maneuvering his chess pieces. The only piece that's left on Gravik's board at the end is Rhodey. So he says, go for it. All I've got is you. Get the bombs launched. You've got to do it. There's nobody else here I can trust. So I think I know what they were saying they cleverly wrote because I could see parts of it and I could see the descent as it was happening in the script, but it wasn't built together. It wasn't developed and there wasn't enough time. It was just these quick moments. Do it. Kill Pagon. Move on. Fight scene move on. I'm going to put it back to you then. Do you think I've got it? Do you think that is what they were going for and that they just missed the mark? Or have I read too much into that? No, I think that's what they were driving at. And there was certainly a few things that you could read into with Gravik that they didn't exploit in some ways. They did that thing that they sometimes do with villains, not just in the MCU and other places where the audience might be in danger of thinking, they're 100% right. They're not a villain. They are actually the hero of this. And then that's the point where they just do something utterly insane that will turn mm. you against them. So that's the bit where Gravik just kills one of his followers for questioning him. Yeah. He's insane now, so we can hate him. And then that's where the challenge comes from because everybody else under him thinks, well, maybe he'll kill me next for no reason. We can't have that. So that's a problem. And the whole child soldier thing I would have liked to see done more with because you can see why he would have such a fatalist view of humanity because as a young spy, he would have seen the worst of people while he was preparing to assassinate them. And he was potentially young and impressionable. So that's how he looked at humanity from that point of view, just seeing the worst in people all the time. And that's what fosters that hatred. But you don't really see enough of his relationship both to Fury and to his followers to get a sense of who he actually was and what he actually really stood for. At the end, it is, let's bomb our own compound. Okay, why? And also, where did all the other scrolls go? Where is everybody? <laughs> There's a, apparently a million people around about here. And you've got some in the field impersonating different people, but you've got close to a million people. You've certainly got hundreds of thousands of people in this compound. Where did they go? I think that's the thing we didn't see enough of him i would have liked to have seen if they had to take the camera off fury and telos to do something i would have liked to have only spent time with gravik get rid of sonia unfortunately as, as much as i thought she was well acted i was tempted to get rid of that character so that you could see the anti-fury and all these ideas that you talked about where he uses fury's tricks against him because he was raised as a protege would have been obvious and if you spend more time with him then that descent into madness would have been obvious because at the start he'd be really charismatic and there was just following doing whatever he says and even when he asks him to do something horrible they're like yeah brilliant i get to do something horrible for the cause but then as time goes on and the plan starts to fail, people don't want to do anything horrible for him. There's this moment that I found utterly unbelievable towards the end, whereby the two scientist scrolls, the male scroll, goes completely self serving and says, I'm holding my own scroll friend and colleague and potentially lover hostage so that you'll let us get out and I'll shoot her. I'm thinking, wait a minute, what happened to the cause? When did you turn? Why are you now self-serving? I don't want to be too cynical, but it seemed like it was possible that they just wanted to get the men are bad joke in there. But it might be too cynical for me to really go into that. I kind of want to raise it, but I also want to not raise it and move off it and come back into, I still think it's bad just because the only reason that somebody who believes in the cause gives up is because the cause has been shown to be failing. Where did we see the cause failing? Because if they really believed in the cause, he would have just shot his friend in the head. You're not getting a bang. I don't care what you do to me. The cause will go on. So it wasn't that. The cause had failed, but they didn't develop the cause and we didn't see it. And I think time with Gravik could have developed that. We could have seen him go mad to the point where he did say at the end, bomb the compound. You would have known that he'd gone insane. You're right. They asked us to just believe he was insane based on one action. 
we needed to see the dissent, I think, and it wasn't there mm. enough. But despite that, I will say I wouldn't put any blame on that on the actor at all. And I'm afraid because I can't remember any actor's name, I'm going to have to look it up. Kingsley Benadier. I honestly think that his betrayal was actually really good. I think what he gave us was really well delivered. Well, he took what was on the page and gave us a really good performance. Yes, but what was on the page wasn't up to it. I feel like I've said this before, actually. I never wanted to detract from the actors at all. It is what they're given. Like you say, this page that doesn't really seem to have enough on it. But without that, I did have one other issue then with this writer. I said one other issue with the writing. I have, surprise, another issue with the writing. (laughs) How did this shy boy that we've seen in the early sequence become that charismatic leader? Wouldn't that have been interesting? Would you have enjoyed seeing that, seeing his rise as well as his fall? Or is it not worth doing that? No, I'm always up for seeing well-developed characters be actually developed. That would have been great. I think they had a good opportunity with Gravik, especially the way to lean into the father-son type dynamic. As much as it's a cliche, it can be done very well. Despite that, you can see them following familiar beats, but following them very well. And like I've already said, the anti-Nick Fury, the young guy that knows everything that Fury knows, but he's also a shapeshifter. That's a really interesting potential idea that they could have done something great with. Fury is a leader and Fury has probably led people through fear in the past a little bit as well. Yeah, probably. When he was in S.H.I.E.L.D. he probably threatened people a lot to get the job done, those kinds of things. So Gravik could have learned that from him and could have taken the best of Fury and the worst of Fury and turned him into this maniac that wanted to now rule the world because he felt betrayed by this promise that was apparently unfulfilled. I'm not sure what Nick Fury could have done to fulfill that promise being Earthbound. Where's Carol? Why isn't she here answering for herself? Well, apparently the galaxy is completely full. Everywhere's taken. And everywhere's not just taken. Everywhere's taken by hateful, violent people. Yeah. There's not even a moon anywhere. There's not even a planet that's already been bombed by radioactive weapons that they can just go and set up on. No, it's full. Even though we saw Guardians 3, which was about an inclusive community of outcasts and misfits. Even though in Guardians 1, we saw Peter Quill on an empty place. There's plenty of space out there. It was just a writing trick. No, there's nowhere. Can we look? No, stop looking. Just turn around. You know where you need to go. Don't look behind the veil, as I've often said. Sorry, don't look behind the curtain, as I've often said. Carol Danvers has apparently been spending 30 years looking for a planet for you, and she'd never found anywhere. What about that planet that Thanos was living on by himself? After he succeeded, he's dead. That's true. Go there. Yeah. It looks nice. Uh, 30 years. No, they gave up after two years. <laughs> they had searched the entire galaxy after two years, and they came back. I honestly think somebody just couldn't be bothered. Have you looked over there, Captain Marvel? Oh, yeah, totally. I completely looked over there. I did that before breakfast. What about over there? Yeah, I did all those last week. Weren't you on holiday last week? No, I did all of it. I did it in my spare time. So I think you just couldn't be asked. Yeah. Which is a shame. But it seems like I'm getting too angry here with the scrolls. But I can't leave it alone yet because I've got more stuff to bring up for them. Are scrolls blatantly evil? I think they must be. Because every single person in the Skrull community is okay with genocide being a reasonable response to a broken promise. Except one member of the council. You're right. No, you're absolutely right. One member of the council and Talos kept to the old ways of being nice. Everybody else is like, genocide, sign me up. And Gaia as well, I suppose. We can assume that she's not cool with it. Or she had to get talked out of it, though, by somebody telling her her mum had died. Which, by the way, Gravik apparently was responsible for, but we're not going to look into that at all. We're not going to talk about it again. We're not going to ask for any information about it. He just must have done it somehow. And then Fury's wife, I guess she wasn't up for it either. She'd signed up, though. I mean, she changed her mind, but she had signed up enough to be part of it. She was keeping to herself, but she wasn't saying, no, don't do that. She would have let it all happen. So even if they're not actively campaigning for it, they're all okay with it. We can all just get by with that idea. Be all right. In the end, it won't mean too much to me. Now, if you have a cult of personality and you have written it well enough, then people will kill for you. We've seen that enough in our own history to believe it. But again, this is where I think we come in with the surface level writing. I honestly don't believe that they showed us enough to make me think that these people had been slightly brainwashed. And this is where I started to really worry about that thoughtless homogeneity of immigrants. Because what they're saying is, 
not only will the immigrants come and take your stuff, they will happily all commit genocide, all of them. I was really offended when this bit came out that it could be that simplistic, especially when the, the thing is the producer this time has said, you don't understand the brilliance of our writing. You know, I understand the danger of your writing and that you haven't taken anywhere near enough care here on what you're saying. But I don't know. Again, do you think I've misread this? You've given me three or four scrolls that have turned their back on it. Was I misreading it? And there are only 10,000 people in New Skrullos and actually the other hundreds of thousands were just spread across the earth hiding and, and they had no part of it. I don't think we find out enough about the scrolls as a species to come to any conclusions really. We're just told a lot of things and asked to accept them. So for all we know, most of the scrolls would not be up for claiming a planet at the expense of the current occupants. We just don't find out enough. Like I said before, we don't see enough of Gravik's relationship with his followers. And it seems like his plan changes about halfway through anyway. It stops being about, I want a planet, and becomes more about, I want power, and specifically powers. He wants to be a collection of all the Avenger powers. I was kind of on board with the idea of him actually lying to his followers, promising them a new home, and he's actually just wanting to get superpowers. And that could have been a bone of contention that come up at some point. But like I say, you don't get enough of that relationship. The Skrulls aren't anything more than just an army of faceless people that don't do anything. You have perfectly, as if by magic, taken me to my third of four sections here, by the way. And I can't thank you enough for that genius transition <laughs> that you've done. But I don't want to cross that bridge quite just yet, because I will just say, I don't think... Gravik was ever self-serving. If it's come across in the script, I think that's another point where the writers have not been clever enough. On the rewatch, I saw him constantly talk about wanting the Harvest to be able to defend his people from the Avengers. And I did believe that. Yeah, I took that as a lie that he was telling just so that the other scrolls would help him. Well, the thing of it is, I can't actually prove it one way or another because I don't think the script gives us enough to work on. I'm happy that it wasn't a lie, but if the writers turned around and said it totally was, I wouldn't be surprised. And we might have to leave that as undetermined, which is again a problem. How can you have something so important be ambiguous? Well, it shouldn't be ambiguous, and it is. Yeah. It's a madness. But like I said, you did give me my bridge into my third section, so I'm going to use it, which is the world building and character development. I could shorten this section to there wasn't any, but this is a long form podcast, therefore that is not sufficient and I have to explain myself. So what have we mentioned so far? The name of the Council of Scrolls is called the Scroll Council. The name of the movement that Gravik has created is the Resistance. and. All of this is just so lazy. The idea of using the resistance as well is a bit offensive because we want the audience to think of them as fighting against an oppressor. So we'll call them the resistance. Hang on a minute. Nobody's oppressing these people. I mean, they might if they were let to do so, if they were let to know about the scrolls. I agree, maybe they would, but they're not. They've got private jets. They're the head of the UN. They've got significant leadership of some of the biggest polities across the world, these people are not in a resistance fight against anyone. So it's lazy writing I've got from the naming of everything that's just trying to get you through the scene. But let's open it up a bit. They do give us a little bit of development. They give us the honor meeting exists. Apparently, you can still challenge somebody to personal combat. Apparently, in a society like this, which is well advanced, you are allowed to challenge somebody for leadership in single combat, Victorian style. There's good sci-fi for you. But they have funeral prayers. So they've got religion. No, they don't. Nobody mentions anything. So they throw in these odd little bits and bobs. But I can't think of any of them that are valuable. Did you spot any world building from the scrolls at all then? I know you said you think they were underdeveloped, but I'm going to ask you to dig deep. Did you see any world building for the scrolls that you thought was good? I like the funeral stuff, but I think I was more engaged with that on the character level, as in the right. this is the grief and this is how we move on from grief and the cremation thing, the, the ritual cremation. It's probably no different to a lot of Earthbound versions of it. Hmm. And I get that they're trying to draw parallels between the scrolls and humans in that we're not so different, which is 
something you see all the time in Star Trek, as in we're going to find common ground because really deep down there is common ground that we can make use of and forge peace. Whereas Secret Invasion went slightly the other way, as in we're all the same deep down when it comes to our worst traits. The scrolls and humans are no different when it comes to the worst of them all. So I find the funeral thing a little bit of nuance actually within that, as in there's a suggestion of culture here. A culture does exist. They have respect for the dead. They have some kind of belief system that goes into it. So Gaia says a prayer and I'm going to steal from the honest trailer of the show, which dropped very close to the time of recording. But Amelia Clark just gets into roles so she can learn fake languages because of Game of Thrones. She speaks whatever language it is in there. And then in this, she does a bit of scroll language. So I like that as a scene. I thought that was really good. The honour challenge, that just seems a bit cliche and predictable in terms of all these things. There seems to always be a, I challenge you to ritual combat for leadership. That's it's so trite and everywhere. In fact, you've got that in Wakanda even. You do, yeah. The most advanced civilization on earth. And we still do leadership by combat. Yeah, and... You can understand it from the Wakandans because they built their culture around the strength and, and fighting and so on. So that works there. So did we in Europe, we built that, but we got over it in a few hundred years because there were better ways. It shows that they've not developed at all. Yeah, we don't see the leader of the Labour Party trying to challenge the Prime Minister to ritual combat for leadership of the country. Much as some people would love to see that, no, we do not. Although we do have two billionaires agreeing to do a cage match, apparently. That is true. Old habits die hard, I guess. I suppose so. So there was the merest hint of culture in there in the funeral (laughs) thing. And it's a shame it's always a funeral or kind of leadership thing. Yeah. I don't know if you ever watched the Christopher Eccleston series of Doctor Who or watched it far enough. Not really. But the Scroll Council meeting reminded me of the couple of episodes in that season where these aliens called the Slitheen were hiding inside skin suits that they, they made from dead people. Oh. It was a stupid thing. They had a zipper on their forehead and they would come out and they'd be these huge aliens. <laughs> I couldn't take the council meeting seriously because I just kept thinking about that, which is admittedly something that I brought with me. You did, yeah. But still. But it seemed that ridiculous to me that this meeting was happening. And it didn't have to be ridiculous because it was all about, we don't have unity in going ahead for this plan. Gravik is offering his unity here by saying, I will take charge and I'll get us this accomplished. But as you've said, he's meeting with people that are posing as people in high office. So you have to wonder what limitations they have, because they seem to have an awful lot of influence just by being who they are. And you've also got someone who's right next to the president who isn't at that meeting for some reason. Oh, wait a minute, because we can't reveal that person's a scroll yet. Exactly. Yeah, it's a madness. So we pretty much said that the scrolls were given no nuance. They were just hitting the bases. It's such a massive shame to take a whole civilization, a whole culture, and make nothing of them. And if this was any show, that'd be bad. But again, to connect these people with immigrants and refugees and not give you any nuance, it's not purposeful, it's not malicious. But again, I'm thinking this is just so dangerous to reduce people down like this and just say, they bury the dead. Yeah, well, humans always do that. You're not being clever. So not good. It's more than that as well, because Gaia says, I want to live somewhere and be myself. I don't want our way of life to disappear by us living somewhere. (laughs) And I'm left wondering, what is this way of life that you want to protect? Tell me what it is, other than we cremate people when they die. Is there more? What is your culture? Odd little things, what they carry, what they say, superstitions that have developed over the years, even though superstition itself has been gotten rid of, but people can't get rid of that from their language. You've created a whole new language for people to speak in, but it's blatantly just English under a cover, a code almost, so people can't understand it, which is a child's game. So it's thoughtless. I think it's dangerous and I think it's thoughtless. Not malicious, but thoughtless nonetheless. Malicious would require some effort and they weren't prepared to put that in. No, I think that's the problem. Let's bring the humans into this as well, then. I am going to say what I said before, that I don't think anybody gets an emotional line that has resonance that lasts longer than two lines of script. I don't think Vera Priscilla and Gaia have any backstory at all. I think Maria Hill's death is there just as a cheap trick to make you think things are deadly. But I'm going to have to bring it back to you. Have I missed anything here? Are there any humans 
that have, do you think, actually gotten a backstory or a good treatment or any character development that I'm missing? Because I'm happy to just label them all, but am I wrong? I can't think of any major development other than the smatterings of insights we get into Fury's past. So the fact that he has a wife is counter to everything we've come to expect of him because, well, he even says, I ignored all of my instincts in order to be with you because that's him putting down roots. That's a tie that people could exploit. That's not what a spy would do. That's not what the spy would do, as Tony Stark would refer to him at one point, at least. So I think Fury is about the only one, but it's also far from a lot. Yes, and the shortcuts that they take, I think, prove it. You get in one of the episodes, and I'm not going to be able to name it here well, but where we see, is it the poem? Is it Raymond Carver? I think it's a poem. Mm, the episode's named after the poem. Is it? It is Raymond Carver, late fragment. They use it at the start of an episode to give you the relationship between the two of them. And you think, okay, this could have been introduced in episode one and it could have been defining throughout the whole series, but actually set up an immediate payoff in the same episode. Even worse, you have the scene where Fury and Vera of both got a gun. Arguably, they are both going to kill the other one because of survival requirements. And we hear the shot and then it cuts away. But then it immediately cuts back and you see they haven't done anything. So again, set up and pay off immediate. And I don't know if it's because episodes are written individually and there's no showrunner to oversee them all. It's just a matter of here's what you've got to do, get on with it. Or if it is just laziness of well, I just need something for my plot, so I'm going to put this in and screw you guys. It just felt like, yeah, they've not put any thought into layering anything, nuancing anything, putting things in throughout the whole story. Everything comes up, and like I say, every emotion is dealt with within two lines. I'm trying to think of anything that lasts a long time. I suppose technically Maria Hill's death is at the end of episode one, and carries on to the front of episode two. So it's a whole episode apart, but not really. Kobe Smulders is not paying her agent enough, by the way. She gets special guest star billing when they show the stock footage of her being shot in almost every episode. (laughs) I mean, yeah, hopefully she gets good pay for that. But from the writers, it's just nothing. Let's just pick up on that. Did Hill's death serve any purpose for you? Did it create a deadly atmosphere so you knew that this script meant business? Anybody could die at any moment? Or was it just a cheap trick? I think it failed to resonate because she's very clearly in the episode to die. She doesn't do anything really otherwise. I know she's very much important in telling Fury that he's old and incapable. Who else was going to do that? Oh wait, everybody. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, so she's there to be a fixture that you recognise because you've watched some of the MCU before. And then when she dies, that's a shame because you know her and like her from other MCU things that you've seen. But she doesn't do anything all that pivotal in the episode itself. And then everybody who was watching was probably spending every single episode wondering if this was the one where Maria Hill was going to come back. Yes. I don't think anybody actually believed that she was dead. And I still don't. The show's over, and I wouldn't be surprised if she just turns up later at some point. Ah, that was a trick. Why did we do it? I don't know. We just did, because of some grander plan that you'll never find out about. So that didn't really work. Also, it annoys people because it's another example of a woman being killed to further the arc of a man when he has plenty of motivation by himself. That's another problem, and it's a problem that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. I think one of the only other through lines, though, was the question about whether Fury loved his wife in her human face or with her real scroll face. That question came up a couple of times. Oh, even that was a trope. The idea, oh, we'll never know if you could have loved me for who I really am. How many times has that been put in a script? Good grief. I'm not saying it wasn't contrived, but it was there more than once. I suppose. Okay. I have to give it to you on the technicality, I suppose. You can win that round. <laughs> is it resolved? I don't think it is. He does kiss her when she's in her scroll face, but it doesn't feel like the triumphant, yes, I always loved the real you moment that it should have been. Well, I think it's rather defining, actually, because for me, that's the same then as every other point. It's technically in the script, but it doesn't have any emotion to it. We've got two characters that died. There's no emotion to it. Yeah. You've got constant emotional reveals. Your mother would have been proud of you. Your mother's dead. This guy is doing things you wouldn't like. There's always reveals coming out. 
and there's no emotion to it. Now, I do think that I understood what the producer meant, and I won't be able to exactly quote, so I'm going to have to paraphrase, when he said something like, you haven't realized how good the script is. Because when I was watching episode one for the second time, I noticed more of the layering, and I noticed more of the spy work that's in there. Specifically, the one that stands out is there are three characters that are put in the episode that come back in Moscow Square to lead Fury to where the Skrulls want him to be. And it shows that Gravik has always had Fury under observation since he landed. And I am happy to see that stuff as being clever spy stuff. And when I'm watching episode one, I remember thinking, episode one's actually all right. I mean, it's not the way I would have done it. It's not the Fury I want to see. It's taken a few Marvel shortcuts and there's a couple of tropes in there. But if I allow MCU to be the MCU and the Marvel genre to carry on, oh, there's actually some, some layering of stuff in here. They've thought about some of this except the opening, which we're going to come back to. But they've thought about some of this. So you see the little girl playing with a ball. Little girl comes back. Old man randomly insults Fury in the pub. Old man is in Moscow Square. Oh my God, Gravik is playing with Fury. He's cat and moused him right from the start. He's having people emotionally torment Fury. His old mentor, right from the start. Oh, that's good, that is. Not only does he want to make Fury suffer... He's going to torture him constantly throughout every episode where these scrolls just turn up and just say horrible things to Fury to undermine his confidence. Oh, this is going to be good. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, OK, if that's what you meant as a producer, I get it. I actually couldn't get the woman, the third character that is in Moscow Square. I don't remember where she was, but I trust you that that character was in there. This is great. But where was that throughout the rest of it? And if that was done on purpose, and it was all about this emotional manipulation, why is every emotional reveal in this given two lines to land and then it vanishes? So I am prepared to say I think episode one was actually good, even if it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, because it did have this layering in. But I've got to ask, did you see any of that layering that cat and mouse, that spy stuff, that setup and payoff in episodes two through six that I've missed. I would love there to be so, and I really kind of hope there was, but did you? No, I think the show wanted us to think that there was. That's why the roadie reveal was kept from us for so long. Right. Because that's kind of an extension of what you're talking about, isn't it? It is a bit. Well, look, he has another operative in a place that Fury is looking for support, and that's another avenue of support cut off from him. Sounds great on paper, but the execution of it wasn't great. I think they could have used Maria Hill's death better even as well. Have various scrolls pose as her throughout. Oh, the torture that would be that way. Yeah, see this person, you couldn't save her. Oh, that would have been brilliant, yeah. Because they establish the whole... Well, they don't really establish it in this show, actually. It's more established in Captain Marvel, and you just have to remember it. But the device they hook all their human subjects to gives them the memories and stuff. Mm. But as far as I know, they can still turn into whoever. So they don't need to have Maria Hill's memories. They just need to look and sound like her to oh, yeah. put them off a bit. Or even Gravik could say, we've got the real Maria Hill in our basement somewhere. They could have done that, yeah. And then you could play with the fact that the audience are assuming that she's alive and we're just waiting for that penny to drop and then they rescue everybody at the end and she is not there. What could have been, and let's extend that into Everett Ross's appearance. Was Everett Ross done just as badly as this or was Everett Ross actually the unique character that was actually awesome? Question, did you think that was the real Everett Ross at any point? No, I was pretty sure he was a scroll. Although I did have to be reminded of where he was at the end of Wakanda Forever. I'd forgotten that. But I'm not sure where this show takes place in the timeline. So is it before Wakanda Forever? Yeah, were the two characters from Wakanda who picked him up actually also scrolls? Or did they just have a scroll in Wakanda for a bit? And if so, why did he come back to wherever he was in the first episode? Because he's a fugitive. There is no answer because it was just a cheap trick, I think, is the way it was going. I mean, you can't have a series and advertise it's about shapeshifters and not have the audience think he's a shapeshifter. You've got to be cleverer than that, especially for the cold open. And the people that had remembered Wakanda forever would probably have been questioning it more in the moment than I did, certainly when I first saw it. 
It was something that I was bearing in mind in my second viewing because the internet had reminded me. Wasn't he in Wakanda at the end of Wakanda Forever? I was like, oh God, yes, so it was. I think that feeds into the thing that you keep saying about the people making this don't have to watch anything that came before. Drives me up the wall. I'd be surprised if Wakanda Forever was considered while they were making this. Oh, it wouldn't have been. It would have been, we want a cameo. Who can we get in? We want somebody to be as strong. Who can we get in? Who's cheap? Yeah. <laughs> harsh but maybe yeah and it wasn't thought about and what bothers me even more than that is they don't even write it believable i thought prescott i don't know who played prescott but i have full marks for creating a paranoid character but the very instance of i can't trust anybody but here's my entire plan oh and by the way i'm just going to get you everything that i've got and give it over to you physically so i've got nothing and you've got everything walks away for a bit and then there's nothing in the script so the poor actor doesn't even have a reaction he's been brilliantly paranoid but when he walks two steps away from everett ross and turns round there's no look on his face to say oh you must be a scroll there's no look on his face to say ah this was part of my cunning plan i'm giving you this because it reveals you a scroll he just attacks him because the plot force needs him to attack martin freeman yeah, it's also the cliche crazy wall, isn't it, that you get with all these things? The Charlie Day meme. It is. And it gets even worse. Everett Ross has to not have the strength of a scroll during this fight because it would reveal that he's a scroll before the script wants him to. Therefore, he has to immediately be knocked over and use his gun to kill Prescott. When a scroll with the strength to rip through chains should have just pushed that admin guy away easily so it's lazy and it's done for the audience it's the worst use of the plot force i've ever seen i am surprised i didn't turn off this show at the end of the opening sequence in how disgusted <laughs> i was with the use of the plot force but for some reason i did stay and i did come to like that spy torture of someone's emotions that i've just mentioned so they did get me back but god only knows how so i'm going to say prescott acted really well to give me the paranoia but everything about the scene truly laughable can you tell me anything that i've missed on how awful it was because i'm pretty sure you can't tell me it was good it's something that sort of passed me by i just forgot about it pretty quickly after it it seemed like quite a lot to throw at you in the opening scene of the show as well it just gives you this onslaught of information about they're everywhere aliens are everywhere scrolls are everywhere blah blah and i'm just like who are you yeah. Why is this important? And if I'd remembered Wakanda forever, unlike the people that wrote the show, apparently, I'd have been thinking, why is Everett Ross here? Shouldn't he be in Wakanda? When are we? What's going on here? And I don't know. It's a very confusing scene, really. It is. And the hate is going to continuously flow through me. So I'm afraid we're going to have to pull it on to my fourth section because I need to find something positive. My fourth section on this is the idea that sometimes there can be good stuff, even if you aren't seeing a level of consistency that is going to please you. So I'm going to have to ask you to tell me something else good that you liked about this show. I just need to hear it. I need to hear some love. Give me some of that. I know that we'll have a whole section on this, but I actually thought the Super Scroll on Super Scroll fight was quite cool. As a spectacle, I quite enjoy it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do it. Yeah, that's my lead in. Perfectly. You've given my lead into the section then. Tell me about that and how good it was. Superficially, it was just two people duking it out with a variety of powers. I found it to be decent spectacle. I know people criticised it online because they said it looks bad and whatever else. I thought it looked good. I think they visualised the powers quite well. The fight was long enough, but not too long, so it didn't outstay its welcome. Again, superficially, I enjoyed it as a scrap. I think that's what I'm trying to get to with this whole idea of this line between objective consistency and the subjective enjoyment. And you've got a point along it. One of the things that really bothered me about this show was I don't think it's more inconsistent than Multiverse of Madness. But I recognise that Multiverse of Madness did something better. I don't think it's more inconsistent than Black Widow, Guardians 3. But I recognise that they both did something that this show didn't do. And at the start, I said, what could it have done to give you enough enjoyment that you wouldn't have looked behind the curtain? And we've already said then Fury is one of the things. If we'd gotten a spy story it would have covered over it but here then there's this superhero moment the coolness of this fight is enough to give you some enjoyment you get some emotional feeling from it we don't get emotional moments from the tragedy from 
before, but at least we're getting the excitement of the fight. I wonder if there's anything else that was cool in there. I'm going to chuck one out for me. The moment that it's Gaia, not Fury, comes out of the dust when she's knocked over the big chimney with Gravik's body. I thought that was absolutely stunning. This black coated figure just comes out of the dust. It's almost like he or she, depending on your perspective, is death itself coming from the veil to take Gravik's life. And if I could pause that moment and just live in it, I'd agree with you. That was cool. But of course, it's a single moment. Do we think then that they could have done more cool? If they're not going to give us spy, but they do want to give us cool, could they have given us maybe a suave Samuel L. Jackson. I mean, this is the guy who played Shaft. We know he can do that. Is there anything else then that you reckon they could have done that would have... Were there more cool moments or could there have been more cool moments? I definitely think there could have been, yeah. I think there's plenty of opportunities for Nick Fury to prove that he was in control of the situation all along. And he was playing everyone to move them into the place that he needed them to be so that he could solve the problem. That could have been a cool moment where the end reveal of the show is, ha ha ha, Everyone here has done exactly what I needed them to do, and I've won. <laughs> that would have been, yeah. What about the attack on the presidential motorcade, then? How was that not either cool enough or not good enough action? Or was it, actually? I thought it was an okay sequence. I found it difficult to follow because it was identically dressed people shooting identically dressed people. So there was aspects of it where I wasn't sure of the geography of the situation, but I thought it was a reasonably well executed action sequence, apart from the parts of it that weren't well executed. Nick Fury shot down a helicopter with an RPG, which is of course referencing the time he shot down a plane with an RPG in the Avengers. Stuff like that. Oh right. Callbacks then not being enough for you. Is that fair to say? I like that as a callback by itself. I thought it was fine. And yeah, I thought that sequence was okay. As long as I didn't try to interpret it too much, I suppose. I was able to just enjoy it on a, again, a superficial level. But if I was trying to look into, here's the point where this happens and here's the point where the tide of battle turns and stuff, I wouldn't have been able to identify that, but it was well put together. Yeah. Well, it was and it wasn't, I'm trying to say, I guess. Yeah, there were parts of it that you liked. I mean, I didn't like the fact that, again, it's the immediate setup and the payoff. British soldier sees alien and reacts badly. Then immediately in very next scene, British soldier appears to have made peace with alien and moves on. And somehow Fury recognises that British soldier is actually Gravik. But Gravik is over there and can't possibly have come forward this far dressed as British soldier. And you're thinking somewhere along the lines here, this is impossible. Even Gravik's tactics as well, you have to question because it's been established that you don't really have to do much to figure out that it's a scroll. They can't seem to maintain their shape when injured. But you take scrolls into a situation where probably at least one of them is going to get shot because it's a free-for-all. There's bullets flying everywhere. And if your intention is to make them believe that we're Russians, there's a high chance of that falling apart. Yeah. It's a shame. I think I'm happy to say with this then that it seems like there are little moments throughout that we've all enjoyed. I just want to chuck a few out there, actually. I've already said that generally the acting I thought was good and people's reactions to the script, even though they can only react for a couple of seconds, they use those two seconds really well. I liked that, well, like you said, Talos and Fury going back and forwards with all the jokes they got, even though I didn't like the character. Odd little things like Talos is really good as flirting as a hot woman. Brilliant. I like the idea that he is actually a really good spy and he can show off his skills. The music in the museum cafe takeover where everybody turns into Gravik, it was really chaotic. And I think it points out a massive problem in the script because if the Skrulls can take over an entire museum cafe in the middle of the day and not cause any trouble, so they've somehow got enough resources to displace all of the people that work there and all the people that were going to be in the cafe without causing any trouble, no security camera trouble or anything, then they can do whatever they want. They have no trouble. But if I take that nonsense out of it, the music playing over that was really evocative. And even like Sonya's humor in episode five, I don't like her, I'm going to say horrible things with a chirpy voice from a person in a position of power. I just find it offensive, not funny. It's just annoying and smarmy. It's, I've got all the power in the universe and you have none. Oh, it just rubs me up so the wrong way. Arguably, that makes for a good villain in Val, but not in Sonya, who was supposed to be a good guy. But when she says, oh, there he is, because the person she's been talking about with the gun that should have been protecting her took a bit 
too long to turn up. She's suddenly saying that chirpy phrase from a position of weakness. And the, from a position of weakness, it's actually really charming. I laughed at that point. So there's some odd little bits throughout all of this that I thought I don't want to go away without mentioning because I did get those emotional reactions from each of those different... I've tried to sort of mention one of each type. I did get those emotional reactions from it. And I thought, let's not have me go away with pure hatred, which I do too often. So I need to bring it back to the light side, as it were. I'm glad I've done it. Can you tell me, have you got anything else? I know you've mentioned a few of those already, but have you got any other sort of light, nice things that were just, oh, I just really like that? Well, you've already mentioned the Russia sequence. I thought that was nicely put together as well. I think that shows you what the potential of the show could have been. The way they set up a relay race almost of passing things to people and identities changing. And they did the usual money saving trick of someone goes behind a pillar and comes back as someone else on the other side, that kind of stuff. That's quite effective. There was quite a few little moments. I think there was at least one in every episode where I thought, I enjoyed that scene for whatever reason. I think the torture scene was impressively harrowing, where Sonia tortured that scroll in the meat locker, was it? Yeah, that was done, yeah. The action sequence where... Gaia and Vara were fighting off Gravix people with the shotguns okay. and stuff. That was all right. No, that's good. I'm just glad that there are some. I, like, I don't want to go away without recognizing some of these things. There were people on this TV series that were creating good work. And if the producer was talking about these things, like the actor, like the sound editor and and the composer, then I am happy to support it. Even if he's talking about the script, like I say, in episode one, where you've got the layered people coming back into Moscow Square. I, I do think they are worth recognising because it's all too easy to bring in the hate. He said, giving you the opportunity to bring in more hate. Is there anything that you want to be cathartic about and say, oh my God, that was so stupid. I have a list. I don't think I should be trusted with that list. So I want to turn <laughs> it to you instead and say anything you want to get off your chest and say, oh my God. about The most egregious thing for me came in the last episode. And it was okay. the scene where Fury and Gravik were talking or who you initially believed were Fury and Gravik talking, where it was actually Gaia and Gravik. And it was supposed to be a revelatory moment because it's father versus son or son getting revenge on their father figure that kind of stuff that's what the moment was supposed to be and even in that moment you had fury admit yes i made horrible mistakes i've made bad choices i did terrible things this is all my fault etc etc but it doesn't work because it isn't fury saying those words but gaia saying them and she's probably hasn't been briefed on what she should say she's just trying to say enough believable stuff so that she can goad gravik into turning on the device so they both get superpowers that's her objective, and she'll say whatever. So maybe she's saying things that she thinks Fury should say. We don't know. We don't know what the truth is there. Yeah. And that's where I talked about resetting Fury to factory settings. So you can get him saying this stuff, but it's not actually him saying this stuff, so we can get good old Mick Fury back in the Marvels again later this year. That's what's going to happen. He's unchanged because he doesn't own up to it. He doesn't admit anything. He doesn't answer for anything. He doesn't grow or change in any way. He doesn't have that moment with Gravik at all. He doesn't have any meaningful scenes with him at all. And when the shapeshift moment came, I was like, oh God, of course it is. <laughs> we haven't got this at all. That's it. We're not achieving anything here. And then you have Gaia say, you killed my mother and my father. So it's okay. She hates him for her own reasons. Be interesting to explore that maybe we're not going to do that <laughs> she's just going to fight him so what you had was two opportunities for cathartic moments from people that wanted to get revenge on other people and neither of them happened even though they both could have so two opportunities for a good emotional ending both wasted excellent in one scene in one scene yeah getting rid of Character development and emotional catharsis and climax, all in one swift scene. Excellently done. Gravik's side of the conversation was good, because he was outlining why he hates Fury so much. Oh, fair enough, yeah. But it's empty because there's no retaliation to it. Well, not really. Again, we don't know where Gaia is getting her commentary from. Is she making it up? Does she think that's what Fury should say? Don't know. Yeah, there's no emotional weight to it at all because it's utterly irrelevant. It's nice that Fury has moved his piece on the chessboard. Arguably, his pieces have, have been removed, but he does have a queen left. And his final movement of victory is to move the queen into position. So arguably, it is a Fury thing to do, but with no emotion or payoff to it at all. So it undermines itself, even though it's doing the right thing. And it teases us with something that we, in theory, as the audience, want and then takes it away from us. 
which makes it even worse. Because they have to get the Marvel fight in. Arguably, Fury should have met Gravik and Gaia should have dealt with Rhodey because Gaia would have Talos's naive, but if they'd have done it properly, good-willed ideology, and Rhodey is the representation of Gravik's broken philosophy, and those two philosophies fight. And of course, Gaia's philosophy wins. And then Gravik and Fury fight, because that's the father and son, but they don't fight, because of course, you can't fight somebody with even just two superpowers. But they don't fight because they solve it with emotion. They solve it with a conversation. Fury just admits defeat, but somehow manages to talk Gravit round because of layering that they've done. So they had this opportunity for two perfect pairings that meet the plot forces requirement for everybody must have a fill in to defeat. They could have even done that with what they'd set up and they switch it purely to give you the fight, which at least you thought was a good fight, but it was the wrong fight for the emotion that they'd teased, even if they'd not set up. Yeah, another infuriating thing. Oh, please carry on. In the same episode was where you had Sonia and Fury trying to convince the president that Rhodey was a scroll. Oh my God, yep. He's a scroll. He's a scroll. You need to believe us and stop this bombing. And Sonia, we have seen shooting people in the leg to prove that they're scrolls, cutting fingers off. She's done <laughs> yep. various things. She knows how to root out a scroll immediately. She's right there. This guy's a scroll. Bang. See? Job done. Yep. We've solved it in two seconds. Even just take a surgeon's scalpel from some local OR and just cut. So it shows purple blood. That's it. Yeah. Don't even have to go overboard. You can really go quite neat and, if you will, surgical with it. Oh, no. Infuriating. Carry on. Bring it out. This is good. This is fantastic. <laughs> anymore. And the Rhodey scroll reveal is another annoying thing. I was actually okay with the notion of Rhodey being a scroll, although I would have preferred it if Rhodey had always been a scroll. So the Rhodey that we've always known has always been a scroll. It's a scroll that took the form of James Rhodes for some reason and befriended Tony Stark, etc., lived a human life, and now we're finding out that they're a scroll. Instead, it's recently replaced, or replaced a while ago, depends who you ask, and the scroll's name is Rava, which ends up making no difference because they don't characterise her at all. And the fact that they don't even have the courage to tell you when Rhodey was replaced, because they're clearly going to wait and see what people think and change it later. Right. Gaia says to him, you've been a long time that she doesn't specify when and people have theorized that because he's in a hospital gown it was during civil war so he's been a scroll since then which undermines endgame because we saw a really emotional reaction to tony stark's death so that was apparently a scroll i would need to watch infinity war and endgame again to see if he bleeds at any point yeah maybe he does i don't know but if we're expected to believe it's that long then no it would have to be five minutes before the show started really for any of it to make sense, because obviously they don't plan it ahead of time. This is the thing. And they can't commit to it yet anyway, because no. they're going to wait and see and then decide later. Actually, I'd not thought of that before, but like you said, if they'd have made him a scroll for 15, 20 years, then that scroll might have actually had a real relationship with Tony Stark and actually felt something, despite being an undercover spy. That old problem that they talk about, actually, with undercover policemen that end up having real trouble because they get so connected with the people that they're undercover with, and you could have had a real big moment. But no, they just undermine it for a cheap, oh, look, we're so clever. Look at what we've put into the script. No, you haven't. You've just built on somebody else's foundation a stupid little stick house that means nothing. No, you don't get marks for that. That's offensive. The real James Rhodes died in their early military career, and this scroll assumed his identity and carried on from there. Easy to do, and doesn't undermine the emotion of anybody else's story. This is why I get so infuriated, famously with the Star Wars sequels. The idea that somebody comes along and says, I can do whatever I want because I'm amazing, and I will undermine anybody else that came before me because they were obviously worse, if I've even bothered to look up their work beforehand. I don't even believe they did. Oh, I'm getting good and angry here. Have you got any more? Because I could give you my lightning fire round if you want. None that come immediately to mind, but I think those are some pretty heavy hitters those ones to be fair you've hit the big ones anything on my list is tiny by comparison that i have 
haven't mentioned already, things like people's emotional payoffs last for two lines. We've covered the big bases, so I can probably just hit a lightning round here and pick a few things out. Like, Hill's dying words are, it was you. Yeah, we all know that people can pretend to be scrolls, so it's a silly line. It means nothing. Her death is a cheap trick. Nobody at any point says, are you a scroll?" even though they should do. The whole thing could have been built around, as I say, anytime anybody meeting up again, we need a code word. We need something here that nobody's going to know. At least have code words. You've got to say dynamite every time we meet, even if it's in a stupid place. If you embarrass yourself, I'll know it's you. Yeah, they had no confirmation tactic, did they? No. Every other thing I've seen with shapeshifters in it, they have some kind of test that they have to perform. They do. In Star Trek, well, Deep Space Nine anyway, let's do a blood test just to prove that we are who we say we are. Just anything. Yeah, it doesn't matter what it is, just anything. Right, I've got a Rocket Man moment. Fury leaves Hill's body at the end of episode one, but the start of episode two, he's back with her body. So it's a total Rocket Man moment. He then gets bundled into a van by Talos, and they don't even have a tap you on the shoulder to make it seem like, oh, you know it's me, this is just for cover which I assume is what it's supposed to be. Gaia has absolutely no time to absorb Groot and Gull Obsidian's powers before she runs away from the compound, but still somehow manages to do it. There's a cheap line that Talos gives Fury about, please respect the past. You shouldn't undermine the past for your own means. And I'm thinking, fair play if Talos is going to say it, and they want to undermine Fury's character. But Marvel, how dare you put a line in about not respecting what's come before? (laughs) <laughs> when you have no intention of reading previous scripts. It was offensive. I couldn't believe that. I could go on, but I honestly don't know if this is enjoyment or people will just get annoyed. I've got a list here that just goes on for freaking ever. Why are the two scroll doctors suddenly in England so that Sonya can get them? What was that about? And so on and so on. Or I might just have a stroke on the podcast if I go any further. (laughs) Let me just count up. Call that 10. Call that 20. Call that 30. I think I've got 40 bullet points for a lightning round of, oh my God. And that's just these little small things that were less than yours. I think you've covered the big ones and I'm happy to, to sit with your big ones. But there were little bits out there that I understand why people are cutting this up. The objective consistency of this internal to secret invasion is just not been thought about. I think they were relying on the coolness factor, the emotional moments and good action to get them through, except episode one, which I will give them because they got those layered spy movements, but they didn't commit to it. But the coolness factor, I think Even you've said there wasn't enough of it for you. Emotional moments, there weren't any because I think they ruined them all. But good action, I think you gave them good act. They did have that. Certainly three sequences that were all right, yeah. Yeah. Is there anything you think I missed that was forming their curtain that they were trying to hide behind? It's a stacked question because I've said hide behind, but you know what I'm trying to get to. Nothing more than I've already said about just individual scenes that I quite enjoyed. Some of the conversations... The only reason I asked you is because I'd rather have ended on the light. I should have kept a light thing rather than ending on a negative. I said that more as a matter of regret, so I can't do it. Maybe let's take a different tack then. And maybe that's not fair because I've already asked you all those questions. One thing I couldn't resist, though, was sometimes when we talk, I don't know if this is true on your podcast with other guests that you have on, but often when we talk... We talk about the other films that could have been made. I think with Ant-Man, we got three films out of it. I thought it was a good success for us. I think we did well to get three films out of Ant-Man. It's definitely been done with other people. Chris and I came up with an entire film that could have come before Spider-Man No Way Home that was about Peter Parker dealing with the fact that everybody in the world knows his identity. There's a film that they could have made out of that. (laughs) Can we do it with this? I don't know. I've already said what I wanted to have seen, so I might have already done it. But maybe even if you give it to me as a summary of, I don't think you like this series enough, so you could confirm that for me. But in summary, what could it have been then? What would you have preferred to have seen and what what could we have had? It's one of those things that's always difficult. That's why we come up with different films sometimes, as in, here's the three things that this thing could have been and it wasn't any of them that we did with Quantumania. So we acknowledged it can't be those three things, but it could have been one of these. And doing one of those means that you fully commit to one of them and you ignore the other two because there's no room for the other two. So the question is about what could they have done in six episodes that would have been satisfying under the proviso of we only have six episodes. Yes. So we have to do something in six episodes. And I think there's a couple of things they could have done. It would have had to be a much smaller scale story. So again, the Civil War is just a title. 
thing. Mm. As it's Secret Invasion is a title that we're going to call this thing because people will know the comic arc. They're already going to be disappointed because there's no Avengers in it, so we can't give them what they might want from it anyway. We've already accepted that. So one option is you have a six-episode thing that is essentially the thing set on a space station. Boy. Where there's one scroll that is trying to self-destruct the space station, and Nick Fury and some agents have to find it. Again, we've seen that a ton of times, the thing, episodes of Star Trek, etc., etc. But that could have fit the resources that this show clearly had. You would add a single location, you would add a clear threat and a clear solution to that threat. It would be a secret invasion, not really, because it's one scroll on a space station. Well, but still. And the other one is Fury trying to deal with the anti Fury, and he's losing yes. resources as the anti Fury is gaining resources. So there's that challenge there. Fury and Talos trying to navigate old school spy stuff in order to defeat someone that is way ahead of them, or seems to be way ahead of them in terms of the resources they're gaining. There's six episodes there, easy. And it doesn't have to be a world domination plan. It could just be Gravik wants superpowers. That could be his aim. It could be. I think that second one's the one I wanted to see. I wanted to see what was good about this capitalised on all the actors then playing personal roles really well. I would have had it to be a very personal story whereby you only see it from Fury and Telos's perspective where they buddy movie through and Every time they meet somebody, they've got to have a way of saying, are they a scroll? Are they not? And even when they meet each other again, they've got to have a code and they can get together with Hill with the same problem. So it's very personal. And anytime anybody else is off camera, they could be a scroll when they come back in. Or even half and half with Gravik as well, because we want to get a sense of who he is. So we'll need some time with him on his own. Well, I was going to say that actually, I would have brought in the anti-fury that you suggested. I'd not thought about that until you'd said it, but I liked it as soon as you did say it. And I would have brought him in to have him as the antagonist causing the trouble behind the scenes, such that I'd have had one or two episodes having a very competent Fury who was really competent in himself, but losing power because Gravik just kept taking chess pieces off the board. And any time Fury wanted to rely on a resource, it slowly got stripped away, either because an authority was turned against him, or it was an object that was taken off him, or it was a person that Gravik convinced that Fury was actually a Skrull, and so they couldn't trust him anymore. Just have those pieces stripped away. So Fury remains competent all the way through, but as you say, he has to suddenly rely on his old times as a young spy, because the spy commander has had all of his agents taken off him. And I really wanted to see tell us well developed to have that ideological battle every time they come across a scroll it's are you with us or with them and tell us is constantly trying to stop fury from making it worse because he goes full-on spy i am prepared to execute this person you can't don't you see it's all about an ideological battle you can't treat this as a spy you've got to treat this as a leader and then tell us gets to be the general and at the end i would actually have had tell us against Gravik maybe in some way played out by other people deciding which ideology. That's how they win. But then, of course, I'd have had the actual competition between Fury and his, his son. And then you maybe have Gaia going back and forth and you're never sure what her loyalties actually are. Could be. That could be the whole setup. And then Fury being careful with what he tells her because he doesn't trust her, but it's the only piece that he actually has to use at that point in time. Yeah, I would have totally done something like that. Okay. Yes, I completely agree with your additions there to what I've said, but that might not be the last thing that we could say. I would like to end on a high point. So I am wondering if you've got anything else that we've missed that you can chuck in there just to make us all feel good about this show? Well, this wouldn't be a high point, but even though I enjoyed that Super Scroll fight, there's things about it that irked me on reflection. So you get the list of powers that's getting installed into the Super Scrolls. And I went and got this list myself. I could have probably got it off the internet, but I did it myself. Because I'm the only person I can trust in line with all this. So the powers are Flora Colossus, which is Groot, Korg. So did they find just a pebble lying on the battlefield that Endgame took place on? And how did they know it was Korg's pebble and not just some random stone? It was on the floor. Also, DNA samples taken, spilled on a battlefield, they're contaminated, right? You can't really do much with them. I'm not a forensic person, but I believe you. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. I mean, they do find blood and stuff at the scene and they do tests on them, but 
I don't know. It's just one of those things. Frost Beast, Hulk, Captain Marvel, Mantis, Thanos, Cult Obsidian, The Extremis, Ebony Maw, Captain America, Ghost. We saw a bit of that. Winter Soldier. Why would you need Captain America and Winter Soldier? They're the same powers. Equally, why do you need Hulk and Abomination? Who's later on the list. Drax is there as well. You've got Hulk. Why do you need Drax? Corvus Glaive. Abomination. Again, you've got Hulk. What do you need that for? Proxima Midnight. Outrider. A Shatari. They're not powerful, are they? They're just aliens. They're killed pretty easily. They shot them with guns. What powers have they got there? Valkyrie. Again, you've got Hulk. Thor. Why do you need Valkyrie and Thor? Gamora. What powers does she have? The collection is very weird. I think they could have just confined it to a few. Captain Marvel, obviously. Hulk. What more do you need? Power-wise. Personally, I would argue you've got Captain Marvel. Who else do you need? Yeah, but we've never had the fight between Hulk and Captain Marvel, so we don't know who's stronger. Okay. I thought she was acknowledged as the most powerful. Ghost? Okay, I'll give you that. Her powers. You can face through stuff. Okay. And also, how many things have we watched where people gain powers and there's a learning curve before they master them? <laughs> No such learning curve existed. No, learning curves went out the window. They're not fashionable anymore. Well, we will still have an origin story at some point where someone will be getting used to their powers, but they're getting used to all the powers and they just know how to use them. Yeah. How does Gaia know to use Mantises? Is it sleep? She makes them sleep? Yeah. How does she know how to do that? Is there an instruction manual that's installed at the same time? I know I'm nitpicking made up crap here, but... <laughs> It's one of those things. Okay, but that I wanted to end on a positive note. Turns out we can't. That's all right. That's just the way it is. I've got to end on a cathartic note instead. Well, maybe you can. Maybe there is other positive things that can be said. No, all I'd have to do is go back and say I thought the actors were good. That's the best I can give you. <laughs> I'm just going to have to go there. I suppose one question for you is, since you may or may not be watching any more Marvel stuff, where do you think any of these characters will go next? Because we get a couple of teases, don't we? We get Furies back in space. We know he's in the Marvels, so he'll be doing whatever he's doing in there. Well, that's it. And Gaia gets recruited by Sonya. I'd heard there was some sort of Team Britain happening by rumour rather than any knowledge, but mm. I don't understand how that's possible because Gaia can do everything, so she doesn't need a team. One thing I will contest is when people say that Gaia is perhaps the most powerful member of the MCU, I don't necessarily agree with that because she put a hole through Gravik and that seemed to kill him. I think she just has a lot of powers, but she wouldn't necessarily be invincible. That would be better. If it was that way, I'd be happier with that. And then she could be part of a team. She's very powerful, but I think maybe even Captain Marvel could take her. That's my guess. It would be sensible if they did it that way. But I will answer your question by saying, honestly, I don't know that I know anything. Because other than Gaia, they've not developed anything at all. I mean, they didn't develop Gaia. They just physically gave her powers. So honestly, I don't see how this goes anywhere. I think this all just gets forgotten. I think they'll bring Emilia Clarke into a new show, be it a film or a TV series. And she will be exposition introduced in that. And everything that's been in Secret Invasion will be utterly pointless meaningless. So where does it go? It just carries on with whatever they got planned because this was irrelevant. We know there will be a throwaway line in either Thunderbolts or Captain America. I forget which one comes first. I think it's Captain America where Harrison Ford will show up and say, the last president sucked. I'm here now. Exactly. Yeah. There'll be nothing of any note. Because no. Fury says to the president at the end, turns out you're Donald Trump and <laughs> you are as of this episode, even though we've no evidence of what kind of president you were before this point, but you're that now. Apparently you're this maniac that tells people to gun aliens down in the streets, even though they have no way of finding the aliens. And does he mean as guardians as well? What's he says? Any non-human. There's a specific wording he uses, but basically it translates to any alien. And that would include the Asgardians that are living in peace in Norway. Surely. Yeah. We could say, let's be technically accurate and go and find her. But what's the point? We've already said it's not going to mean anything. They're just going to put their own new plots in and not worry about what's gone on here. So you'll get the exposition you need from the next show or film, whatever that is, and presumably be asked by a producer to be happy with that. Why are you questioning it? Just love us. And you either will or won't. Yeah. Oh, I feel bad. Oh, I don't feel good. I need to come back around to something nice. I think we're going to have to do our summaries. I think you're going to have to do a summary, and I'm going to ask you to end on something positive for your summary. Summarise this for me, but end on something positive. My summary is, I wasn't keen on this show. It very quickly lost me after what was an okay first episode. I think it went pretty sharply downhill after that. As we've said, it's pretty clear that there was no actual plan on how anything was supposed to come to fruition, how it was all supposed to progress it 
was just a procession of stuff happening and they tried to hide it with good actors or good scenes between those actors or the odd decent action sequence but this was far less than the sum of its parts overall I think and there may be a couple of things that I'm vaguely interested in I quite like the idea of Rhodey picking up the pieces of whatever his scroll imposter did during the events of Armor Wars. They didn't really set that up here. I wouldn't have minded an actual proper scene with Rhodey after they rescued him to say, okay, turns out my imposter gave away a lot of Tony Stark's stuff and i got to sort that out now. I'll be back in a couple of years with my own film to do that. I don't know if you could have got a Harrison Ford cameo, but they could have perhaps referenced Thunderbolt Ross eyeing up the presidency as a threat to that. Maybe, I don't know. I would like to see Gaia again because I think there's an interesting character in there somewhere. I just don't think we got her in this show. And I don't know what context she would come out in. I guess Carol would perhaps have a history with her in some way because when we saw that they met when she was a child. But the whole mother stuff, could we have not had the mother in an episode to underscore the weight of that loss? Show how it happened, maybe? I don't know. So there's a lot of bits here that might be okay if we see them again that's always the case isn't it oh there's that element here that we could take somewhere and put somewhere else and might be all right if they do that but yeah i can't see where guy would turn up except in a captain marvel-ish project of some sort because it makes the most sense for her to reconnect with carol i guess maybe she's in the marvels we don't know yeah well yeah i don't have an awful lot positive to say here (laughs) if they replace valentina with sonia i'll be happy okay because she's better i don't like valentina at all we'll look out for that then i guess my summary is going to be that I thought this was a carelessly put together, quite thoughtless script that had some really dangerous points in it and that betrayed Fury's character. So they stripped him back to nothing when they didn't need to be and made lots of old man references when they could have so easily depowered a spy commander by making him a spy again, not being a commander. The dangerous stuff comes in a thoughtless treatment of immigration and refugees that didn't intend to cause offence, but I could easily imagine caused much offence in various communities, if I were told. The January 6th referencing really upset people. Really? Yeah, because it was so bludgeoned in, I think. I don't think there's a problem with referencing it as such if you're planning to make some kind of powerful point with it. For example, they used footage of it in an episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds to say that this was part of the beginning of what spiralled into World War Three. This was the start of it. This is where it began, or this is part of where it began. So that was a powerful point they were making in that score. And this, they were just doing a half-baked Trump reference, him galvanising crazy people to further his own agenda kind of thing. I can see why it really upset people. Well, that's what I mean by careless, thoughtless. It's not malicious. It's just thoughtless. Just throwing things in without realising what they would come to be. And it didn't need to be that way, because like I say in episode one, if I put the opening aside, what they set up, the possibility of Gravik sending his scrolls in as soon as Fury landed to emotionally torture him, to get that revenge that a betrayed son needs on a lost father, it could have really done something. But it is in episode one and then forgotten, much as the emotional scenes are set up whereby somebody is told their mother is dead but would have been proud of them, and they react. But then they have to quickly ask a question of the character set next to them to move the plot back on. So there's no emotion in there that can last and survive the plot force, which brutally hunts down anything before it and slaughters everything of value, I think. Which is such a shame, because the acting is really good. And there are moments in it that both of us have found differently, but nonetheless cool odd little scenes here and there that meant something to us so we thought were well done but they are so outnumbered by the sheer amount of things that don't pass any objective consistency not only with the mcu at large but with inside the story itself that doesn't worry about it to the extent that it doesn't even world build it doesn't build up a scroll community that's where we come back into this dangerous portrayal of what some people were afraid of as the other all it does is accidentally confirm that fear it's just so awful to do but just didn't need to be that way when there are these seeds of really great characters that would come out. So I think it's a waste. I think it was thoughtless. I think it was tropey. And I think it was a betrayal of the characters that we got. And the actors put a lot of effort into recovering it, but unfortunately weren't 
going to succeed. But I kind of want to end on on those actors. I want to hold that image in my head. There were some great people in this. And that's what I'm going to take away from it. But there we are. That's where we're at. We had a show that didn't do right by great actors. Still, there it is. So, that was our discussion on Secret Invasion. Thanks to Neil Stenson for supplying the music. If you like what you heard and you believe that we are in fact not evil scrolls and want to carry on listening to us, then do hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or anywhere else you might happen to get your podcasts. If you are on a platform that does have ratings, please give us a rating and we'd love a comment. If you want to talk to us about any of this stuff, I am required by Neil Before Pod rules to ask the guest Craig what rating he would like. So I will do that. Weird on the opposite end of this. I feel like a scroll. Anyway, I'll have to ask you. What would you like people to rate the podcast? I would love a five. I think five is the least you could do for making it this far. I now feel really dirty for having asked you for doing that and I'm going to have to embrace my scroll persona to carry on finish this. So if you do want to discuss Secret Invasion with us scrolls or anything else in fact that you think we scrolls would know about then you can find us on Facebook and Twitter under Neil Before Blog or X or you can even leave a comment directly on neilbeforeblog.co.uk As always we hope you'll join us again next time on Neil Before Pod otherwise it just leaves me to say ladies and gentlemen boys and girls Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and of course, good night.